Nissan. This is the opening drive on 101 ESPN. Brought to you by Sumner One. Guess what day it is. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday and welcome to the opening drive on 101 ESPN in St. Louis, where it is 7 o'clock and it's chilly. Ooh, time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler. And if you're in St. Louis, you know, uh, if you know, you know that it is cold. I think we're going to have wind chills tonight of uh, 15 below, below zero right now. In St. Louis, it's 11 degrees. Your uh, second alert uh, weather. Here on 101 ESPN, because you're getting your first alert from Town Four, right? Yeah. There so you this go. is your this is your second alert, and it's 11 degrees outside, and it's windy. So uh, and it's I didn't expect it to snow. I didn't expect to have snow on my car this morning, kids. I did not either until I looked out the window. I was like, mm-hmm. ooh. I'm going to have to start paying attention to Tempe. <laughs> You should. <laughs> How you doing, Morning. Danny? I'm doing great. Bro- uh, Brooke and Dan are here. And Matthew. My kids great. are fired up. That It's snow on the ground, man. Oh, they're thinking late start. They're thinking day. school's going to be off. Ooh. They're going to turn on KMOX and listen to, like, all the alphabetical listings. No, and, they won't. <laughs> no, I'm not sure they know that that exists. <laughs> I wonder if it still does. I don't know. Are That's are a good question. Go Darn it. Snowboarding? Or not snowboarding. Or sledding, I guess no. I should say. Snowboarding would be extreme, huh? Yeah, they're going ice skating somewhere if they can. So do they just have like a school portal to check that tells them they're off? There is uh, phone calls. Still, okay. So they, they leave messages or you look on Twitter and there's something there mm-hmm. usually. Yeah, you find out. Oh. It's pretty hard not to. Cool. Good. Yeah. Well, one of the things, if they get out and go ice skating, I have a pro tip for them. Move their feet. Oh. So you're saying that didn't happen last I'm night? I'm saying the Blues could use a little of that too. Absolutely. After yeah. five, two loss to the Washington Capitals. Uh, who are not great this year. They're better than the Blues are, but they're they're still not great. Uh, here's the way things unfolded here on 101 ESPN. Just 10:24 into the game, former Blue T.J. Oshie. And by the way, Washington has a worse power play than the Blues, but T.J. Oshie uh, made their power play a little bit better. Pass from Butch Navich, missing Thomas. Caps come back over the line. Pareko had it, lost it. Oshie fires, shoots, scores. T.J. Oshie got the fumbled puck inside the circle. Those gloves side on Bennington, and a power play goal has the Caps leading 1-0. But remember, it was only 10-24 of the first, and the Blues have Nadub on their squad. Perico put it in behind the net, cut off by the Caps. Colton pinches down on the near side, takes it in behind the goal. Over to the far corner now, draws two Caps to him as he plays it up to Letty. Quick shot, they score! With Walker right in front, Letty's shot deflects in. And the St. Louis Blues have tied the game one to one. And I think it's going to be Nathan Walker's goal. It was 1-1 after a period in the second period. Washington with a couple, including another power play goal from Oshie. Then Dylan Strom scoring just 34 seconds into the third to pretty much put it away for Washington. Nathan Walker made it close again with his second of the night, 4-2 at the 4-0-1 mark. And then in the final minute with the Blues net empty, down by a score of 4 to 2 they were bitten by their old friend Caps have cleared off the near wall. It finds its way to Oshie for the hat trick, and he scores. TJ Oshie the hat trick and a 5-2 score for Washington. 19.5 to go. I go, I go TJ. TJ's one of the nicest former Blues, one of the nicest Blues ever. Great guy. Yeah. Is it hard to believe he's 37 years old now? That's amazing. Wow. 37, TJ Oshie. It just seems like yesterday he was at the Olympics and yep. doing his thing in the shootout. He was a fan favorite here in town. He really was. Come grow with us. And 37 years old now, yeah. TJ Oshie. He was like, he and is the nicest guy. So uh, he would always go to the same grocery store. I'd see him inevitably all the time at the grocery store. And whenever anybody's asked TJ Oshie to sign, you know, he's pushing sure. his card. Anybody would ask him to sign, he'd sign where, wherever he was. Just an awesome guy. Yeah. And the Blues had to trade him because they had the choice between he and Tarasenko at the time. And so they traded him for Troy Brower and then the de- next day signed Tarasenko to his long term contract. Yeah. It's um, very, special to see that he's doing that at 37 years old. I will say it looked like prime TJ Oshie last night against the Blues. Well, Especially when you have the Blues special teams falling apart like that. The penalty kill, the Blues power play. Mm-hmm. The fact on power play that once again, I know that they have been getting a little bit better as of late, 
But then to have that performance last night going 0 for 5, not creating really any chances, it felt like. I don't know how you explain this. When, uh, when Drew Bannister came aboard, one of the things he said is, throughout my minor league career, I can count on one hand the number of times where I feel like I haven't gotten effort out of my team. Well, get a load of this, Drew. Well, obviously execution's the number one thing. Like we, we lacked execution from from our top players in those those situations. Um, you know, they were able to score. I mean, you know, the first goal. I mean, a lot of them were preventable. Uh, the first goal should be iced. Uh, should never even be back in our end. Um, you know. We talked about blue line turnovers, second goal. Um, we have an opportunity to get the puck in deep and, and we're not able to get it in. It turns goes the other way. Um, you know, power play as a whole, we just, they have to be better. We have to execute. That's that's plain and simple, and it, it bled into the rest of our game. It, it uh, didn't give us any momentum at any time. Is it too simple to say? I mean, you did, the good things you saw in the last three games in the power play just weren't there tonight. Yeah, I think that's safe to say. The second period was as bad a period as they played all mm-hmm. year. It was lethargic. There was no flow to it. Now, there are a lot of penalties that probably led to it on both sides. But the Blues had one scoring chance in the second period. One. They had three power plays, and they had five shots. That was it. They had two hits in the period, and he mentioned the top players. Thomas played 25 minutes, 12 seconds, and was kind of non-existent mm-hmm. in the game. Shen had a ton of chances. Chances couldn't bury. He had Kevin Hayes had one shot. Saad had one shot. Kairou, two shots. So when your big players are supposed to show up night in and night out, and the margin for error for the Blues is limited. It's small. Those guys have to be good players, and they weren't last night. No, they looked very slow, lethargic, as you said, and that's the second straight game. But, guys, we've also seen this several times this season. Does it feel like maybe the magic of the new coach coming in has worn out for the Blues now? It it does to me. And people talk about retool versus rebuild, and I don't think the Blues need to rebuild, but I think they do need somewhat of an overhaul. And I don't know if the players will be available. You remember that Sunday, July 1st of 2018 when the Blues signed Perron and signed Bozak and we thought they were done and then later that night they traded for O'Reilly. Three players with tremendous leadership of, of ability and veteran presences that were all leaders of a Stanley Cup championship team. I don't know that those players exist in the NHL five years later, but to me that's what the Blues need to get because Braden Chen can't do it himself, and while we all love Colton Pareko, he's a great guy. I don't think he's. I don't know that Colton has the personality to hold other players accountable. We talk to Robert Thomas every week, and Robert, another great guy. But is, is he going to go to somebody and say, "Hey, you got to pick it up"? Is he is he that guy? I don't think so. Maybe Justin Falk is. I don't know. But is Justin Falk good enough to be able to do that? I I just think that they need uh, somewhat of an overall here to kind of replenish the leadership that was lost with all of those guys. And I don't, I'm not saying that they should have kept Petrangelo and O'Reilly and Perron. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying they, they, they need to replace those guys, though. And with the guys that you have, because it's going to be tough just to overhaul everything, right? I mean, you can't just do it and say, well, here we are on a Tuesday night against the Capitals, and we're going to play a little bit differently next Tuesday. No, and by the way, it's tomorrow, Saturday. It's back-to-back with the uh, the Capitals. But that third period, after watching the second period and some of the numbers I just gave you and seeing how lethargic they were, I would have rolled out the third and fourth line the entire time. I would have put a whole <laughs> yeah. different power play out there, five yeah. different guys. Who's hungry? Who wants to compete? Who wants to play? Yeah. I really would have done that. And yeah. they don't have the depth or the skill where when they are behind in games like this to be able to come back mm-hmm. into the third period. I don't know what it is about these past two games where they fall behind and they don't have the ability to get back in. The lack of physicality in that game last night, guys, I don't know how you explain that from this group. I mean, seven total hits for the Blues, just two f- through the first two periods. What does that mean? So since Christmas, they have not scored more than two goals on five on five since the break. So (laughs) they were relying on the power play, which went, as you mentioned, Brooke, 0 for 5 last night. And it's kind of funny that they're relying on a power play that was awful before Drew Bannister got there. But they have been relying on this power play, but they have not scored more than two goals 
at five on five since the Christmas break. And that is a serious problem. And, and a lot of that comes down to compete and it comes down to your first line being a first line. And the first line last night wasn't very good. It was not. Other news in the world. And by the way, the Blues have their Hall of Fame induction ceremony tonight. Big Walt is going to be inducted along with the late Pavel Dimitra posthumously. And Mike Liut. Perhaps the greatest goalie in Blues history will be enshrined tonight. Uh, that will, and we're going to talk to Mike at nine thirty later on in the show. I get to see Mike Lee walk into a Noggles one time after a game. A Noggles, mm. yeah, I was those don't the, exist so anymore. They, they don't. But it was <laughs> pretty cool. You know, I, I was uh, thinking about this last night, talking to somebody about how back in nineteen eighty eighty one. You know, I I loved Mike Lee. I thought, you know, this is the coolest guy in the world. And now I'm texting with him. Hey, can you come on my show? Pretty weird. Yeah. Well, he's ready to go, I'm sure. I'm sure he's excited about doing this, too. And I'm with you, Randy. I mean, they've had great goaltenders along the way. He is probably the preeminent goaltender that they've had in the history of this organization. Yeah, so looking forward to the induction ceremony tonight at the MAC. College basketball last night, 14th-ranked Michigan beat, or uh, Illinois, 14th-ranked Illinois beats Michigan, 88-73. to And Brooke may have found her head coach for her Titans. Pretty excited? Uh, Maybe. Well, we're going still through the interview process Mm -hmm. right now, but I've been campaigning for this. Bobby Slowick completing an interview with the Tennessee Titans yesterday. Now, they're going through a lot of different processes here, but at the same time, I think it, that's encouraging. That's the right direction that they should be going with. How about Vrabel interviewing with the Chargers? I saw that yesterday. That's an interesting thing. I wonder if you can find an offensive coordinator. <laughs> I, I think that would be very important. Well, I think the biggest thing they need to do when they hire a coach is not waste Justin Herbert. I think they would be. If they if they give Herbert to Belichick and McDaniels, mm-hmm. I think you're wasting the guy. We, we saw what McDaniels did to Sam Bradford here. And he was fortunate that he had a finished product in Brady when, when he got Brady. I... I would think that that might happen with Vrabel, too. That's why I think Jim Harbaugh is the best choice for the Chargers. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. It just, I I was surprised to see Vrabel. We really haven't seen his name being brought up that much. No, in no. The and I think Atlanta did or is going to bring him in. And one other fun note, <laughs> and I love this, Cam McCormick, tight end, University oh, of you Miami. you just took my take it or leave I'm it. I'm sorry. Oh, I will not use it no, then. No, wait. no, no. Go right well, ahead. It used to be people would joke that they went to college and they were on a seven-year plan, okay? Yeah. Cam McCormick, a college football player, was granted a ninth year of eligibility yesterday by the NCAA. Take it or leave it. He is the reincarnation of Frank the Tank. <laughs> oh, I'll take it. Yeah. Take it. <laughs> is that, it's funny because I actually was going to do that for my take it or leave yeah. it today, too, because it's such a crazy story. I had to look up exactly how this happened. You had several injuries. Then, obviously, mm. players get a COVID year. The fact that he is going into his ninth season, he should be getting his doctorate. <laughs> I hope he's getting his doctorate The average point. NFL career only lasts three and a half years. <laughs> yeah. Nine and he played years. nine in college. To put it into context, he started his college career career at Oregon when Justin Herbert was a sophomore. It's 2016. That was the recruiting (laughs) class that he was a part of. And he's an Oregon native and played six years there and then followed Mario Cristobal down to Miami. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Brooke, I mean, all the injuries and he got (laughs) medical red shirts. He had the COVID year. And uh, again, he's the reincarnation of Frank the Tank. So there you have it. We're off and running here on 101 (laughs) ESPN. We have some NFL action this weekend. Tomorrow, uh, we are not going to have the games because we have the Blues. But on Sunday, we've got the Lions and Buccaneers. That game is at 2 o'clock. And then the Bills and Chiefs is the Sunday night game right here on 101 ESPN. We will preview the weekend of NFL playoff action for you next on 101 ESPN.
Should be a great weekend in the NFL, and recency bias, as happens often when a team has a bye, has kind of snuck in here. The Ravens are a nine and a half point favorite over the Texans, and there are actually people that are picking the Texans to go into Baltimore and beat Lamar Jackson and the Ravens. And I'm here to tell you right now, it ain't gonna happen. Look out, Texans. <laughs> this uh, th- this this could be kind of ugly, actually. I, uh, I I feel for. Uh, C.J. Stroud, and I feel for that Texans defense that has to try to, try to slow down. It's not just Lamar Jackson anymore. It's, it's a great running game. They've added Dalvin Cook. They've got four receivers. They're getting Mark Andrews back. I don't know how you stop them if you're the Texans. No, I think that Baltimore is a better rushing team and a better team against the run as well. But would you guys be shocked, though, if this game was at least close? Or do you think that this will be not necessarily a blowout, but not a close game? Baltimore favored by nine. Does Houston cover, to your point? I would say no. I think Baltimore scores five touchdowns, and they win this game 38-17. 38-17? Yeah. It is a, you know, all these QB matchups are pretty cool. And this is a fun (laughs) one. It's C.J. Stroud against what will be the two-time MVP and Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson and the Ravens, I would assume, have to be the favorite of any AFC, NFC team left. They've got to be. No they doubt. have to be. Uh, well, I agree. And Lamar Jackson, just one playoff win in his career, and he's going to get his second career MVP. How much pressure is on him in this game? I would say trying to erase what happened in 2019 when they faltered, mm-hmm. that's got to be pressure that. on him. Yeah. Oh, it's got to yeah, be. That was the Titans. That it was. was. The Titans. They went on to win the Super Bowl, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. Okay, Randy. That was a low blow. Don't don't take away that moment from the Titans, okay? <laughs> no, but you're right. Because of his playoff lack of success, there is pressure on Lamar Jackson yes. to have his receivers actually step up and catch balls this year. And they finally given him weapons. They gave him an offensive coordinator. There's no reason now. There are no excuses if you're Lamar. If you don't win, we could all look at other things before. Now, now if they don't score... You could only look at him. No, and then it would be the conversation of what we've been talking about with the Cowboys. Then it turns into that whole, oh, well, yeah, it's great during the regular season, Mm -hmm. but we know what's going to happen when playoffs rolls around. In the NFC, the number one seed is also playing. And again, we're looking at recency bias. We're looking at Jordan Love against the Cowboys. It was the Cowboys, people. It was the Cowboys in the playoffs, people. Let's take a look at what the San Francisco 49ers have accomplished this year. And... Take into account that they're healthy. Uh, Chase Young is going to be healthy. Uh, They've got Bosa going. Fred Warner is healthy. They've got their defensive backfield back. And, of course, offensively, we know what they are and all the weapons that Brock Purdy has. And he's got a healthy Trent Williams at left tackle, and their offensive line is back. Again, great as the Packers have been. Youngest uh, playoff team in the league since 1978. But I don't see how Green Bay goes into San Francisco and gives them a game. I was looking the other day. I was curious about this. When the Cowboys lost, and I'll get back to Green Bay here in a second, but they moved the needle. So the day after the loss, it was the highest number of viewers for first take, get up, NFL Live, and the Pat <laughs> yeah. McAfee show. I think people love to see the uh, the good and the bad when the mm-hmm. Cowboys lose. Especially the bad. The, all right. I, I'm curious what you guys think. And mm-hmm. I've got Lamar. I've got Mahomes. I've got Josh Allen. I've got Jordan Love. And no one talks about Brock Purdy. Isn't How that come? amazing? I mean, if you said, okay, with the quarterbacks that are left, who are you going to take? You're going to take those ones I mentioned probably before Brock Purdy because he's thought of as a game manager. I, mm-hmm. I think he's more than that. I know he's got a lot of weapons, and they run the ball. He's got great, great weapons in terms of what they can do to throw the ball. But, man. Give him some credit here, too. Well, and the other thing is he doesn't have the mobility that those other guys you talked about have. And I think that's probably one of the things in the 2024 edition of the NFL. You look at Josh Allen scoring on that 52-yard touchdown run. You look at Patrick Mahomes being able to take over as the Chiefs running game in their win last week. We all know about Lamar and his ability. And by the way, he's become a fat pass first quarterback. But I would think that that's the reason that people don't look at Purdy. Purdy, is, he's Kurt Warner. And there's nothing wrong with being Kurt Warner. How about Russell Wilson? Do you think he's a little Russell Wilson in there, too? Because they can yeah. run the ball, some yep. weapons no, outside, yeah. great defense and that mobile, he has, too. Mobile yeah. within the pocket. Yeah. I, when does the narrative change for him? How how many games, how many wins here does it take mm-hmm. where that narrative changes for Brock Purdy? Or will he always be known as a game manager, even if he takes the 49ers to a Super Bowl? I think guys are penalized for having a lot of weapons. That, that happened to Kurt, without question. And I think he'll, uh, until... 
people recognize that he is dropping dimes and watch him play, I don't think people will appreciate what he does. But he is a really accurate passer. Niners are favored by nine. I do think Green Bay covers since mm. the midpoint of the season. Niners and Packers ranked first and second in expected points added. So I'm looking for a ton of offense in this game. And I love the intrigue of the, the coaches, too. The Packers head coach, Matt LaFleur, came from Kyle Shanahan's coaching mm -hmm. tree. That's going to be fun, too. Yeah. Either way, I think what the Packers have accomplished this season, excuse me, <clears throat> what they've accomplished this season is excellent. As you mentioned, Randy, youngest NFL team to win a playoff game since 1979. I think that that's really special what they've been able to accomplish this season. But I don't think anybody had these expectations, so you congratulate them for that. Absolutely. All right, on Sunday, you've got a couple of games as well, and probably the least sexy game of the weekend is the Buccaneers <laughs> at the Lions at 2 o'clock St. Louis time. That's an NBC game on Sunday. Lions are a six-and-a-half-point favorite. And it's, you know, here we're, we're talking about uh, C.J. Stroud against Lamar Jackson, and we're talking about Jordan Love against Purdy, and now we're talking about Jared Goff and Baker Mayfield. What's not sexy about that? Two number one picks in the draft, uh, right? Yeah. I'm, I think I it's a great story with those it's, two. It's a I story. Do too. <laughs> but I don't think we're going to be electrified by this game. I think we will in terms of the atmosphere. The atmosphere and how it projects off your TV into your living room. You know, the, the Lions are, are trying to become the, the first team to advance to the conference championship for them since 1991. That place is going to be electric. So while I do think the other teams and the other QBs <laughs> have a little bit more story. Help me out here, Randy. No, I'm, I'm trying I'm, to pump it up what, a little I'm bit. Think about your guy, Jerry Glanville. Did you ever see the uh, Washington America's team Super Bowl victory? Yes. And Jerry Glanville going up. I think it was Andre Risen going, you scared? You scared because Washington was <laughs> right. maybe the greatest team <laughs> ever assembled and yes. then Washington blew him out something like 45 to 3 it was it 45 to 3 should have been a scared well I still think that this has a chance to be fun to watch it does oh no doubt about it and, and I'm rooting for Detroit and I'm really rooting for Detroit fans I'm kind of like uh, 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 well I know I'm, I'm opposite of uh, Matthew Stafford I'm, I'm I'm rooting for their fans. I really don't care about their players. <laughs> Opposite. Yeah, yeah. How about those comments? Yeah. This past I'm weekend? happy for the guys. Yeah. But he didn't, doesn't like the fans Not anymore. Not that city. Yeah. Detroit <laughs> favored by six. Do you think uh, Tampa Bay can cover? I think it's going to be hard. Let's talk about the important things here. <laughs> I think it's going to be difficult. Don't you? Uh, and granted, Godwin and Evans are still studs. Mm -hmm. But you have to, in th this environment, in the playoffs, you have to be able to threaten somebody with the run. And I just don't think that against that defense, Tampa Bay is going to be able to threaten with the run. And all of a sudden, then you're turning Hutchinson and that group of pass rushers loose, and I think Mayfield will be in trouble. I agree with you, too. And also, we've seen some inconsistency from the Bucks this season. And the last time, and I know that it was earlier on in the season, but the last time that these two faced off against each other in Week 6, the Lions took care mm -hmm. of business 20-6. to six. I think that this will yeah. be a more competitive game than that. But I still think it's going to be the Lions coming away. And then Sunday night is the cherry on top. It's the Coupe de Grasse. Uh, it's the game of the weekend. Matthew loves that. No. No, he hates it when I do that. This is the sexy game. Oh. This is this the sexy is game. This is the sexy game. Just like, All the I mean, entry. Yep. We're already in St. Louis. Do we have to butcher more French? Oh, we already do, yeah. Okay, fine. At least in Chicago, they call it Des Plaines, right? So, you know, that's... <sighs> they call, Vers they call it Versailles and Marseilles in, in Mar well, that state, we, too. We call <laughs> Des Paris De Paris, so oh we're good God. there. Okay, so, number one, is Allen and Mahomes the new Brady and Manning? Has this surpassed Burrow and Mahomes as the new Brady and Manning? I think Burrow and Mahomes, yes, it has surpassed that conversation. Also, Burrow not in the conversation yep, this season, right. so that makes it easier to say. I think in order to get to that point, though, Josh Allen has to win a Super Bowl. Then you could have more mm -hmm. of that conversation. Which was always the complaint about Peyton Manning, too, until he I won. Know. It's pretty, yeah, it's it's pretty it's interesting true. how it works. But it is a great competition between the two, and I'm excited to see where it goes. But I think this is this is, this is is what makes this game so interesting, what it makes it so sexy, intriguing, mm -hmm. as we were talking about, because you have that battle. You want to see these two quarterbacks duke it out and see who is going to come out on top. Mm -hmm. I think it should be a great game. When you think about Brady and Manning, doesn't Allen have to go to a Super Bowl first for that to be yes. to that? That level yeah, yeah yes. i think yeah at least going i think that would help so we look at this game and it snowed again they got another four feet of snow in buffalo by the way they asked their fans <laughs> the uh <laughs> the bills in the franchise asked the fans to come out and shovel again they're working now and they're not offering <laughs> them though food or drinks you're worth four billion dollars your franchise food drinks or tickets 
you can afford to help yeah. these fans out. Absolutely. Give them something. You're worth right. $4 billion. No How doubt. much does a ticket cost for this game? So let me get this straight. You have to go ahead and scoop out your seat, basically, in the snow and paying probably how much for a ticket for the game? So it's not just generally snow shoveling this is just to go to your specific spot is that how this works that's, that's what i was okay. seeing yeah this past weekend that they had to do that's pay amazing. some people to come in there and do it or at least a snack or yes. you know a, a, just a little yeah. snack drink something like that i i don't think that's crazy i'm i'm i fear for the chiefs in this one and i know spags will have a great plan but one of the things that Spags does great is he attacks a scheme, and Josh Allen works outside the scheme so much. And because Kansas City's offense struggles so much, and I don't think they'll be able to run the game. So you bracket Rishi Rice. You've got a struggling Kelsey now. I really worry about Kansas City being able to hang. Right now, Buffalo is a three-point favorite. If this winds up being a 10-point game, I won't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised either. I'll put the, uh, the line on... Let's say interceptions, fumble, whatever you want. Turnovers by Josh Allen at two and a half. Mm -hmm. And if he's over that, then we got a game. But he's going to turn the ball over sometime. But then it doesn't yep. matter because he makes up for it in the end. I, I'm i not sure where I'm going here. I think I'm going to go Buffalo just because they're at home. Um, I think Josh Allen is so much fun to watch. He's my favorite player to watch in the NFL right now. Really? He and Lamar. Just because you don't know what he's going to do. He's a gunslinger. And I love watching yep. players like that. I'm thinking maybe 28-17, that kind of a game. Yeah, that sounds good. I don't know, guys. I'm still a little bit bought in on the Chiefs. Did you guys see Rasheed Rice, what he was able to do? I know that the mm -hmm. run game has to be a little bit more established. But what do you guys think about the narrative? Do you think it's a little bit overblown about this being Patrick Mahomes, his first playoff road game? I think that's a big deal. I it's, do, too. It's hard, especially or is it in the a little playoffs. overblown? I don't think so. Uh, I, I believe that it's really well, – I know it's really hard – especially for a quarterback to go on the road in the playoffs. It's another it's one thing to win at home and or on the road in the regular season. But everything is ratcheted up and it's and you've got the conditions, you've got the fans against you. It's loud. The energy level for the other team is enhanced. That defense is going to be like a bunch of barking dogs for Buffalo. It's going to be hard. Well, uh, much more difficult than it is when you have Arrowhead where they the fans know what they're doing and they shut up when you when their team has the ball. With that storyline, though, great quarterbacks, great players, they always channel hey. it into motivation. Why do you think Joe Flacco is Joe Flacco? <laughs> the difference between Joe Flacco, the, re the thing that makes him elite is going on the road and winning playoff games. It's hard to, man, it's hard to do. If he would have gotten to a Super Bowl, Joe Flacco is a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, should have, could have, would have. Joe Flacco. But Joe Flacco would go to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, <laughs> right. Doing what he's done and... Maybe he comes back with the Browns again next year yeah. as a backup. Yeah. There was a game 1986. It was when the, the uh, Giants went to the Super Bowl. Joe Montana goes on the road to Giants Stadium, and they lose 45-3. to three. And he, threw, uh, you know, he never threw picks in the Super Bowl, but I think he threw a couple of picks in that game. And he got knocked out, too. But that, that happens. That Giants team had a tendency to do that. Yeah. Remember, oh. he hit, remember how he hit the turf, the cold, hard turf yep. in the Meadowlands? Guys, football was, football was great when you could knock a quarterback out. Wasn't that Jim Burt that hit him? Yeah, it was. Good yeah. call. Yeah. yeah, well done. Uh, back in the day, the 85 Bears, Brooke, they made it a point, their goal every game, defensively, was to knock the other team's starting quarterback out. And they mm. did it for eight games in a row. Yeah. <laughs> We're pretty good though. When yeah. you got LT on the on one end, uh, I'm talking about the 85 Bears. Oh, the 85 Bears, yeah. yeah. But that Richard was Richard Dent, yep. Singletary, Dent McMichael, McMichael, the fridge. yeah. Fridge uh, was in the middle. Yep. Uh, and then you had uh, Mike Singletary flanked by Wilbur Marshall and Otis Wilson, and you had uh, uh, Mike Richardson and Gary Fensick. And ironically, Gary Doug Fensick. Plank was not uh, one of the safeties. The 46 defense was named after number 46, Doug Plank, <laughs> but Dave Duerson and Gary Fensick were the safeties. And Gary Fensick, uh, the, the husband of St. Louis and Parkway North grad, Sandy Mashman. I feel oh. like I'm in the middle of the fight right now. There you go. Oh, that, was, that was such a fun was team. Was that the year? So that's when they had 60. It was like 60 plus sacks. Yeah. That bears. Okay. Might, yes. have, had, might have had 72. Really? Yeah. We are the Bears. Because I remember because we were talking about the Eagles defense last year, how yeah. good they were. They had 70 sacks. And then the only other team that could compare to that was yeah. the Chicago Bears in 85. 72 sacks for the Ooh. 85 Bears. Hmm. Uh, the 84 Bears set that record. Oh, 84. 85 heading in the 60s. And uh, do you have the 84 oh. Bears schedule 
up. Uh, get that. Just we, we'll give. Uh, we'll we'll make make Jay, Jay, Jay Delsing wait a minute here. Take a look at that '84 <laughs> Bears schedule and look what they did against Jim Hannafin St. Louis Cardinals. They went ten and six. They played them in Week Seven. They lost twenty-one to thirty-eight. Whoa! Jim Hannafin's Cardinals kicked the crap out of the Bears, and they would have if it wasn't for a stupid call by stupid Pat. R.I.P. Millette. Uh, St. Louis Cardinals in 1984 uh, would have made the playoffs and would have beaten that Bears team in the playoffs and would have gone to the Super Bowl. But stupid Pat Millette with a stupid offensive pass interference call against Roy Green. Dan, you know it was stupid. Don't be waving me off. You know it was stupid. Look, Pat, Mo- Pat Blank and Millette. You're just a little frustrated over the past. I remember the game. I remember it quite well. I was not happy at that time in my young life, I, but I, you know. I, I was more than unhappy. <laughs> I'm sure you were. I would have been one of those guys if they had YouTube that ripped the TV off the wall and threw it. Oh, is this the Randy Blackout <laughs> oh, rage yeah. that we've talked about that before? Was a little angry, yeah. yeah. How old would you have been at that time, teenager? 80, no, 80, 60, 70, 22. 22, yeah. You had not realized how to calm your <laughs> not then. emotions. No, I was, I was, I was angry. And I, how old are you now? I'm 61. I'm not sure that you have learned to calm your emotions. The thing that's <laughs> happened is that I've lost my emotion for the NFL. So that's a good thing. That is mm-hmm. a good thing. There but, uh, man, I was. And you know what, guys? I wasn't mad for a day. I was mad for weeks. Yep. I was. Well, I'm still mad. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I was, was going to say, say I don't minute. think. It's been years. <laughs> yeah. So I was more. You know, you know what? I take back that R.I.P. for Pat Millette. Oh, my God. <laughs> Terrible. Oh, 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 oh my God. All oh, right, I, what's I the next segment, Jay Delsey? Yeah. yeah. It's still, Dinkinger still hurts me. <laughs> Read the rundown, Danny. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. What's, what's coming up next, Dan? Yeah, we got, we, Jay we're Delsey gonna, coming up. We're some golf with <laughs> Pat, Pat Blanking Millette. Uh, <laughs> Rod Dower, the, the Cardinal offensive coordinator, said you should have seen it from the end zone view. It was even worse. Man, I'm You need to get over it, Randy. Like, it's I, over. I don't know. I don't know. Jay Delsey is next on 101 ESPN.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Blues last night get bounced by the Capitals 5-2. to two. They'll have a chance at redemption coming up on Saturday at Enterprise Center. That is a 7 p.m. puck drop, a 6 p.m. pregame show right here on your home for the St. Louis Blues 101 ESPN. Also last night in your local college basketball, number 14, fighting Illini, beat up on Michigan 88-73. to Back in action tonight, St. Louis travels to face off against VCU in an A-10 battle. That's a 6 p.m. tip-off on ESPN. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? here. Danny Mack and Jay Delsing, Sunday morning, 8 to 10, talking golf here on 101 ESPN. Brooke, Dan, and Randy, and Jay joins us now. And Jay, I know you listen to the show, so I want to ask you, first of all, is there any sports event that happened a while ago, whether you were involved with it or not, that sticks in your craw like that? Don Deckinger. There you go. Thank yeah. you very much. This, yep. this comes to mind. I, I, it took me five years to get over that. Yeah, I, I think most people, I, I, you, you haven't, you, it's, to bring it up so quickly, you haven't gotten over it. Nah, you know, you know, Randy, I also had about, a, about an eight-foot putt to take the lead on the 72nd hole at Memphis that I hit just a tiny bit too soft, and I'm not over that either. Uh, I, and that <laughs> it didn't go in, but it looked really good. I, I, I totally can relate. Well, not I can't relate at that level, but I can understand where you're coming from because I'm sure that you look in your mind's eye right now and you see that putt rolling, right? I do, and I and, and the funny thing is, guys, I hit this this shot in from the fairway. I I was 160 yards away, walking to the green, and I already knew how the putt was going to break, and I already knew I was going to make it. I just had it all figured out in my head. I was just trying to relax myself as much as I could, and yeah. And then Jim Gallagher made about a. And of course, I'm over this too. Jim Gallagher made about a 25 foot putt on the last hole to beat me by a stroke, and I remember getting in the car. And my daughter said to me, Dad, and Jim Gallagher's oldest daughter, was her name was Mary Rose. And they said, Dad, what did Mary Rose's dad do to you? <laughs> I, I, I said, I'm not sure, girl. I don't think Mary Rose's dad did anything. I, I didn't know what to say. I couldn't bear. I could barely talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jay, speaking of moments that people won't forget, I don't know if you saw this, but during the opening round yesterday at the American Express, Adam Shank's second shot on the 16th oh, hole yeah. landed in a spectator's drink. Right in a cocktail. Yeah. Yes, that was that? absolutely crazy. And it led to a birdie for him, actually. Where's the craziest spot that you've seen a ball land that was still in play? Well, well, Brooke, I had three older sisters growing up and a mom that had more, I mean, if, she, if my mom would have had any more clothes in the house, we'd had to get rid of a kid because <laughs> my mom was a, clo was a clothes horse. And I had a shot at Hartford into a woman's handbag. And, you know, you're, you, she was not in the fairway. So I, you know, I went out there I, and I'm, I'm looking in this bag and I'm like, what do you have in here? <laughs> there was so much gear in there, you know? And she's like, well, and I'm like, I don't want, I don't really want to know. You know, I just had to get a, <laughs> I, I had to get an official and get, figure out what to do and, and drop and everything. But man, this woman had like a hair dryer and she had another purse and had all sorts of, you know, and I was like, you got any money in here? Should, nah, I don't have any money. <laughs> How long did it take to find the ball? Because I, it's funny, Rocchio just literally looked over at me because I have this giant bag right next to me just full yeah, of what are things. Yeah, you guys doing all that? I, yeah, you know, in, in case of emergency, you never know when you might need a hairbrush or, <laughs> I don't know, extra snacks, computer, I, crazy things. Well, you're that. talking to four guys right now, myself, Danny Mac, Randy, and Rock. <laughs> we need help. There's an emergency around every corner, and we just kind of wing it when that yeah, happens. We do. But <laughs> when the ball went in the 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 the, the purse, I wasn't going in the purse. <laughs> I just I just was like, okay, and I called an official, and he's like, where is it? And I go, it's in there. And so he got he got he got it out, and and um, and you didn't take a penalty, up. right? That you don't get a penalty. No, for no, that. Pe no penalty. No, no penalty. No, no penalty. You you have to uh, you don't get to place the ball. You get to drop it because it wasn't actually sitting on the ground which I learned that, you know, when you hit a bunch of wild shots on the PGA tour, you pretty much learn the, the rules. 
uh, in a very weird way, but you learn a lot about the rules when uh, some of the guys that hit it a lot straighter than you do probably don't know them. Jay, as you probably well know, Bernard Longer announced that this year will be his last Masters, and he's played in something like 58.7% of the Masters that the players, all the players have played in. It's amazing, the stat, in terms of how many Masters he's played in and the amount of time he spent at Augusta. What has he meant to golf, you think, and what has he meant in particular to uh, PGA Tour champions? Well, first of all, Danny, that, that is a gr- I was going to bring that up. That is an amazing stat. So if you think about it, he's played with 60, per- let's just say 60% because it's very close, 60% of the all-time players that have ever played in the Masters. So we are talking about l- legends, Hall of Famers, um, all sorts of, I mean, I, I, I read that twice because I thought something was wrong with that stat because it was <laughs> I did so. Too. Yeah, it's incredible. It was, It was so remarkable, but I played with Bernard Langer a lot. He is the epitome of like a German machine. He is so methodical and he, he, he doesn't make any, now he's got one of the craziest putting strokes you've ever seen. If you watch him putt it, it literally could make you nervous, but (laughs) his ball still winds up somehow goes in. And what he's done is he beat Hill Irwin's uh, all time record. He's got 46 wins on the champions tour. He's in. I think he's six. He's going to be sixty-six this year, and he he is he's incredibly fit and uh, just a super super nice human being. But but he's got I think over a hundred and ten worldwide wins. So he's just he's just kicked butt wherever he's gone. He's as nice a man, extremely quiet, um, and 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 just. Uh, we just used to call him the machine because he was just always there and always playing well. Hey, Jay, I, I read Rory McIlroy's idea for globalizing golf and taking tournaments away from the United States. I, I read that from a jingoistic point of view. And, yeah, there's some not major tournaments that could be taken away from the United States of America. But from a broad perspective, what do you think of Rory's idea to play tournaments in India and around the world rather than having most of the tour events here in the United States of America? Well, you know, Randy, that's the thing. that This is like to wait for this decision to get made in this union, whatever the heck it's going to look like to get done, because that's what I think is going to come out of this thing, some sort of global world tour and I, I i don't know what it's going to look like i need to know what the details are like i mean i'm all for going to some of these places that ha- have not you know had the best players in the world and, and try to trying to grow the game but it, what's the cost and what does this whole thing look like at the end of the day and the thing that i'm really concerned about <clears throat> guys this is probably the most crucial time in the history of golf is who's going to be our partners what is it going to look and look like? Who's in charge, and what happens to live? How do, and how do we get? How do we reunite this thing? I really believe they're going to unite it. I read these, this um, article that said there's a two billion dollar. I forget now. They're calling it a different thing. Danny, we talked about this on the show. Like, not a, 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 It's a fund, you guys, that are getting to that, that the Saudis are putting together to pay the guys that didn't go. To live, and I forget. There's they've they've called it a couple of different names, but the whole thing is crazy because Randy, they are trying to to evaluate what the PGA Tour is worth. So all of our assets are worth. And if you think about it, we have right about 50 uh, TPC clubs around the country. We have all of these assets. We've got over 3,000 people that work for the PGA Tour. And what about all of our retirement money and all of these other things that would have to i just i just don't know how you do it and it, there's just it's just such a, a massive undertaking i just i really don't know what's going to happen at what the fallout's going to be how many sponsors are we going to lose what events are going to go away are we going to lose like say the john deere event which is in quad cities in a, a midwestern event crazy well supported by the community it's the longest running um sponsorship that we have on, on in the pga tour and on its calendar and again it's not one of the most popular tournaments by the by the um, uh, the, the top twenty players in the world, but it, it means a hell of a lot to that community. And every year they raise between 
you know, three and six million bucks to that community that really needs it. So there's just a lot at stake here. And, and, and a lot of the things that, that Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas and all the old greats kind of raised us to try to, to try to do for our communities is really at stake here. Jay, who do you guys have on the show on Sunday? We have Adam Betts. We, uh, and, and, uh, Brooke, we were talking about you and your golf journey down there and, and, uh, and um, Adam was smiling when he said he, he watched you come down and practice. It was, it was great. And we also have <laughs> it was not good. <laughs> Lucy. Yeah, he didn't say anything about the way you were hitting it, which is fine, Brooke, because, <laughs> because we all know it's a hard game. And then we have Lou Stagner on, who is a stat guy. He is the assistant coach for the Princeton golf team. But Lou breaks down handicaps. He breaks down the advanced metrics in the game of golf and tries to uh, help people understand the, the stroke saved. Um, uh, metrics and, and things like that. So we, we have a really fun conversation with Lou this weekend. Looking forward to that. Always good to have you on this show. Thanks so much for the time and have a great weekend. You guys too. Stay warm somehow. You too. See you <laughs> later. Jay, Jay Delsing with us on 101 ESPN. Coming up, get your text in to the Air Comfort Service text line 314 399 9646. 314 399. Yo ho. <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> uh, take it or leave it is oh, next. Oh, 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 no, we're in. Yo-ho. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> take it or leave it next on 101 ESPN.
think. We put it out there. If you like it, you can take it. If you don't, send it right back. Get your text in test 314-399-9646. And give us your take it or leave it. Brought to you by Gloria Lou Realty. Visit GloriaHasTheBuyers.com and start packing. That's my final offer. Take it or leave it. It is time for Tioli here on 101 ESPN. Brooke, Danny, Matthew, and Randy, great to have you with us. Guys, did you see that uh, Harrison Ford has been crowned a living legend of aviation? Living legend of aviation. Uh, take it or leave it. This is because he survived two plane crashes where he was the pilot. That makes him a living legend of aviation. A living legend of aviation. Yes, yeah. that's, that's what he. That's what he's been. He has a really? passion for aviation, Randy. I didn't know so that. he must, and he's still among <laughs> the living. So <laughs> there's a passion there. That? Yeah, Harry. Uh, I don't know. That's why he's a living legend. I guess if you die in the crash, you probably aren't a legend if, because. Well, well, you're still you a legend. Still could be. Yeah. Well, Just I not mean, living. Uh, not of aviation though, because that means you, were, by definition, were not a great pilot unless well, something went wrong with your plane. Everybody knows who Amelia Earhart is. That's a great point. Okay, she's a legend. Okay, well done. Okay, so yeah, he, okay, he's a living, living legend of aviation. Harrison Ford, one of my favorite actors. I, I uh, will take know. it. I will take it then. So I, I would say my two favorite actors are uh, Harrison Ford and Gene Hackman. Robert Redford would be up there. Al Pacino. Mm -hmm. John Cusack. Eh. Leonardo I'll leave DiCaprio. That. I'm, I'm going to be a different. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I like Leo. I always I like too. Leo movies, so he's one of my favorites. Take it or leave it, guys. I don't know if you saw this. While we were all sleeping last night, I know some people still might have been up. James Nail, he's gone. No. He is. No. Yes. He is. <laughs> Did you want to do your music, Randy? Oh, we Why always do this. <laughs> James Nail, we'll always remember you. Even though it was always very brief, I will never forget when the Cardinals didn't they DFA him on his birthday. <laughs> that was a that was a tough moment, but we appreciate that you were always around when needed. So we will never forget you, James. Where'd Nail. he go? He was a he's Missouri native. Yeah, he's going to KBO. Yes. Oh, cool, good for him. So, do we yeah. need to fill a roster so, spot? Yes, and that's where I'm getting at. Take it or leave it. The Cardinals are about to add another reliever. I'm going to leave that. I think it just gives them flexibility. Now, they may as we get closer to spring training, but it does give them flexibility on their 40 man roster. You guys, Cardinals are playing chess. We're thinking checkers. WB Wilking Rodriguez. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Take it or leave it. I, I, this is hard for me to do, but Taylor Swift has actually been good for football. Oh, totally take yes. it. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to take it. I was actually having this debate with somebody at the gym yesterday where he came up to me and said, he's like, I, I have league sources that are telling me that the relationship is fake. I don't understand why it would be fake. She's, yeah. She was already very successful yeah. to begin with, and now you're going to have Bill's Mafia versus the Swifties this weekend? Oh, man. Uh, take it or leave it, she goes to Buffalo. I'm going to take that. I'm going to take it. I wow. bet she's there. Yeah. And let's see. Take it or leave it. I'll put the number at 10 on camera shots of Taylor Swift. Oh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with, with the under there. They barely showed her on uh, NBC last weekend, only a couple times. I think they showed her entrance going in. I remember yeah. seeing that and, video and right going at the beginning of the game, and then she, when they, the game was in hand, right, they showed her cheering and doing mm -hmm. the leaning back and forth. You see Waxer. more on social media with it than you do okay. now in the games. Yep, it was so prevalent in the games when she first started coming mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. and now it's not as much in terms of... I think you just see it more on social media. Yeah. Matthew, what do you got on the text line there, brother? Take it or leave it at this point. The only way to shock the system of the blues is to start making trades. I'll take it. Yeah, I'm going to take it. I think at this point you have to, right? Well, I'll take it. The, the thing, though, that they have to deal with is a lot of no trade clauses. And yeah. there's mm -hmm. some players that probably would be wanted by other teams, but with the no trade being invoked by players, it, it becomes a little bit tougher to navigate those waters. Yeah, we saw that happen with Tory Krug going into the season. Randy, you with us? Yes, taking it. Okay. <laughs> Matthew, what it, else you, you have? Take it or leave it? Yeah. Take it or leave it. No away teams win this weekend in football. No away teams win. I'm going to I'm going to take all the home teams. Yes, I am. I'm going to take that. Mm. Detroit. No, there has to be Buffalo. 
Kansas City or I'm uh, San leave Francisco. It because I still think the Chiefs are going to win. Chiefs. Okay, good. Last weekend, wasn't it just one road team won? Yes. And that was it. Yeah, Packers. Yeah, that was it. Matthew, another take it or leave it, please. Take it or leave it. The Neil O'Donoghue missed field goal as the 84 ba- Big Red season comes to an end still pains many St. Louis fans. It does. And you know what's interesting? When Jack Buck made that call, 49-yard try, the uh, th- the clock winding down, the Cardinals didn't have a timeout, and he comes on the field. And as soon as his foot touched the ball, Jack's call was no chance, no <laughs> chance. He did not have a chance to hit that field goal. He was not a very good kicker anyway. And a 49-yarder in the bad weather at that notoriously bad turf at RFK when you're rushed because you don't have a timeout and it's fourth down, he really didn't have a chance. One more take it or leave it, oh, please. Uh, by the way, if you ever, <clears throat> if you this weekend when it's super cold, if you're an old football Cardinal fan, or maybe you're just a football fan, that game is on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Watch Neil Lomax in the second half of that game. Mm-hmm. He How many games? Like 380 yards in the second half. It was unbelievable. Take it or leave it. You have seen repeats of Rams and St. Louis Cardinal football games. The number will be 100. I'm going to take the over. For me? Yeah. Oh, I'll take it. Oh, yeah. Well, and I, I watch the Vikings game every year. On the anniversary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You said that your son, Dan, likes to enjoy watching some of the games. Does he go back and watch the no. Rams ever? No. So he, he, he no, he couldn't do that. He, uh, he, uh, let's see, he will watch the games that are currently on and a lot of times just takes it on with social media. Yeah. Just looking at highlights because he wants to play fantasy football. And that's how he does it. He loves Red Zone, though. I love Red Zone. Nothing wrong with Red Zone. Red Zone's like my favorite thing to do on a weekend is just sit there and watch football. No fans were better. No fans had it better than Greatest Show on Turf fans. So they got to go to work. Here we go again. Let's do this crowd. Warner, the quarterback, fires up the middle. The pass is caught to Isaac. He took it, and he's gone. Amazing. Dick Vermeil told us yesterday that was going to be the first play of the game. Yeah. It was a play pass with a double post. With the players doing their celebration. That's called the bob and weave. What do they miss is he has the two receivers in the slot here. They're both going to run a post. And whoever the safety comes off on, they throw it to the other guy. You see the post there, and then the post there. Both of them go into the inside. The guy that they came off on and left free was Isaac Bruce. And the first play of touchdown. That's so good. That's as cool as it gets. That's my favorite moment that I've ever seen in St. Louis sports. Really. Take it or leave it. Is it time to move on? From that? No. Yeah. You, you okay. win championship, championships never go away. Okay. You, All don't, right. you don't ever move on from David Freeze's home run. You don't ever move on from that's a winner, that's a winner, that's a World Series winner. No, you never move on from championships. Go crazy, folks. Right. You just okay. go. All right. No. Now I know. Uh, one final point. I, I want to give some credit to Terry Stevens on the YouTube chat, mm-hmm. who 22 or 23 minutes ago, uh, made a comment. He said, Neil Donahue gets a bad rap for that missed field goal. It was a chip shot in a ru- with uh, a rush time, a rush, no timeout, and poor weather. 20 minutes before we even talked about it, Terry yeah, Stevens calling, calling a shot on Neil yeah. Donahue with every single point Randy made. I just want to give him credit on that. Was one. not a chip shot. Not a chip shot. All right. Thank you very much for your text. We do appreciate them. Thank you, Matthew. Coming up next year on 101 ESPN, the Blues lost, and Doug Armstrong talked to, at the coaching change, and we've mentioned this before about the eye test. How'd they do with the eye test last night? That's next on 101 ESPN.
perspective on the day's top stories. It's the opening drive's fresh take. Obviously, execution's the number one thing. Like we we lacked execution from from our top players in those those situations. Um, you know, they were able to score. I mean, you know, the first goal. I mean, a lot of them were preventable. Uh, the first goal should be iced. Uh, should never even be back in our end. You know, power play as a whole. We just they have to be better. We have to execute. Uh, that's that's plain and simple, and it, it bled into the rest of our game. It, it uh, didn't give us any momentum at any time. That's Blues head coach Drew Bannister after the Blues 5-2 loss last night at Washington. It's 8.06 in St. Louis. Time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler, Brooke Grimsley, Dan McLaughlin, Randy Carricker. And I, for one, appreciate the honesty yes. of one Drew Bannister. Probably playing with house money when he does that to an extent, too. But I'm with you. I, after the effort last night, and I mentioned earlier in the show, that second period was as lethargic as this team has been. And your big players did not really show up. Thomas was invisible, 25-plus minutes. He had Shen, ton of chances. Kevin Hayes, one shot. Saad, one shot. Kairou, two shots. These are the guys that have to be... Every night, every the, the margin for error is so slim for this team. They are the guys that have to show up, and when they don't, it, it you get lopsided games like last night. I don't know how you can exactly explain what we saw because now that is two straight games where you have heard Bannister point out the lack of effort, even the lack of physicality that he's mm -hmm. seeing from this group, and he even specifically pointed out the veterans. Why are the veterans not able to really show up in these games, in these moments when you need to come back? It has to have something to do with one of two things. Either they aren't as inherently competitive as we thought they were, <laughs> they don't have as much pride as we thought they had, or uh, they just have their money and don't want to play. The Blues are $486,000 under the salary cap. They just might be fat and happy. Guys, what does Drew Bannister have to lose by sitting players and saying, you know what, we're going to take away your ice time even though you're a highly paid player or we expect more out of you, you're not doing it, you sit. You've got nothing to lose. You're the interim head coach, mm -hmm. yep. and you're fighting for your life, too, to show what you can do at this level. Right. And, Brooke, I loved what he did with Butchnevich in one of his, his first games when he sat Butchnevich down and singled him out and said, "He's we just have to get more from him. But when I mention Jordan Cairo, right, Jordan Cairo's going to get $64 million. Jordan Cairo might not care about ever winning a Stanley Cup. I, I don't know. He, he had his moments after he got booed. But I, I'm, I hate to single him out, but he's a young player that obviously has had his efforts questioned by everybody in Blues Nation, whether it's fans or coaches, everybody has questioned his effort. And maybe he's happy with where he is. And that's the issue of giving a player, a young player like that, so much money mm -hmm. before fully proving their yeah. potential. And it goes back to the question that we've had going into the season. And we keep asking ourselves is, who is the star player of this group? I think everybody, wouldn't you say, thought it would be Jordan Cairo going into the season, but you haven't seen him show up in the way that was expected or even as expected for what he's getting paid. And at least when Vladimir Tarasenko had sporadic effort now and then, he was the best goal scorer. Well, the second best. You want best. to go watch him. Yeah, right. You paid money to go see number 91 play. And for a five-year period, I think only Ovechkin had more goals than Tarasenko did. He was definitely a guy that you went to watch and see. By the way, I use Jordan Cairo there as an example. Yes. But nobody, which Navish is certainly not immune from criticism here. Robert Thomas, our guy, is not immune from Justin criticism. Falk. Justin Falk, Brandon Saad. Yes. It's, it's hard to find a Blues player where you say, okay, there's consistent effort from that guy every single night. Now, JR has a great piece up that we're going to talk about in our next segment, uh, actually later on in the show at 9.15, uh, asking about the core players of the Blues, who, who are essentially the untouchables. And he lists Robert Thomas and Colton Pareko. And those are the kind of guys you need to win a Stanley Cup. But you need stars to win a Stanley Cup these days in the NHL. The untouchables, and he did not mention Cairo, but... On the flip side, I always say this, it takes two to tango. Who would want to take on the $64 million contract right yeah. now that he's got when he pl doesn't play hard on certain nights when you watch him? Mm -hmm. 
Nobody. There you go. So you're stuck. And that's roster construction at this point that's kind of got them backed into a corner. Um, I, I think when you look at this team, it's hard to figure out why when you have a chance to make the playoffs that you don't get supreme effort second half of the season, every shift, every game. Last night was lethargic, and it was not what they need, and it's not going to work moving forward. And maybe the performance of this team and the effort of this team is why they gave Nathan Walker the two-year contract a couple days ago. <laughs> and they don't have anything that you can exactly hang your hat on, right? Something that you say, oh, this is what is special about this group. Special teams prior, wouldn't you guys mm-hmm. agree, in recent years for the Blues, that was something where you would say that's their bread and butter. Penalty kill was not effective last night. Power play was not great. And I know that they have been a little bit better at as of late, scoring five goals in their last three games. But when you go 0 for 5 last night and they weren't creating anything, it seems like no matter what Bannister has tried to do, mm-hmm. even moving around some personnel trying to get creative, there's no chemistry there. I think when you when you bring in Nathan Walker and you say, okay, we're going to extend you, you're on a fourth line, what that's telling me is that they, they are building from that line up. Yep. So you got Snuggerud coming. You've got some of these other guys. They got other guys that are coming that clear some space potentially to say this is our future. But then the question becomes, who is your core? And to that point, we're sitting here in a transition year, 23-24. Clearly a transition year. The, the general manager said it. The owner said it. So in this transition year, if... 2027 is your target to be back in contention for a Stanley Cup. Right now, who's leading the way? I guess it is those two, right, in 2027? Thomas a, and Cairo. A 33-year-old um, uh, Colton Pareko and a 20, Robert's 24, 27-year-old Robert Thomas. Who else among this group would you say, okay, that guy can be part of a Stanley Cup championship club in three years? I got to throw Cairo in there because you can't move him. Yeah, but is he going to, do you honestly think he's going to help you win a Stanley Cup? Though? I think he can. I think the he ability can. is there. Yes, but he just hasn't shown me that he's going to consistently produce both ends of the ice to be a Stanley Cup champ. Well, and this was just my perception of this when you made the change with Craig Berube. Obviously, we talked about Craig Berube and Jordan Cairo, maybe not necessarily not getting along, but that the message wasn't working that Berube was trying to have with Jordan Cairo. I thought by bringing in Drew Bannister and promoting him in that situation as your interim head coach, he connects with young players. And so I thought this was a huge chance for Jordan Cairo to kind of show what he could do with a coach that was, I think, very opposite of Craig mm-hmm. Berube. And the message yeah. of the say is the same. The delivery is different. And I'm surprised that you're seeing some of the same results here. That is today's Fresh Take here on 101 ESPN. Coming up, we're going to head to the celebrity line and we're going to talk with Joe Vitale about why it's so cold outside. That's next on 101 ESPN. (laughs)
day, when I was growing up in the 70s, the average temperature in St. Louis on a high for each day was 65.1. In the 80s, it moved up to 65.6 from 65.1. Then it went up to 66.1 in the 90s, 66.5 in the 2000s, and then 67.8 in the 2010s, and now it's a little over 68. Joe Vitale joins us here on 101 ESPN. Joey V, on a morning like this, I'm longing for the uh, global warming. What's going on? Yeah, people keep talking about this thing. I, I don't know where it is. You know, in some days, in some days, you, you, you hope it's true, but uh, we, we can certainly wish for it to be a little bit warmer. Days like this, I wish, I wish I was living in San Francisco, where Randy, you bring up temperatures, and you know that that is an area where it stays pretty consistent between fifty and eighty mm-hmm. all year long. You know, a lot of people don't realize this with 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 bread. So so San Francisco is making the best bread in the world in the world and it's not because of the bakers out there it's really the temperature of, of san francisco in the coast in like the coastal air uh so when you think about sourdough bread it's basically it's yeast and live bacteria and if you if you think of the temperature gauge for bacteria and yeast to live it's around that 50 to 80 degree zone that's why when you put food in the refrigerator it's like below 35 because bacteria has a rough time excelling under under that temperature and then of course you put food in the oven at you know 200 300 400 degrees and it kills the bacteria so san francisco's got this crazy balance for all year long it stays in the perfect zone for bacteria to grow and then of course with the coastal air it is the it's the epitome for for good bacteria to grow people have said this about i think the beer is a guinness in, in ireland and something to do with the water where you can't really mimic Guinness or maybe O'Doul's or one of those beers anywhere else in the world because of the water and the pH level, the water over there. And uh, so, yeah, days like today, I wish I wish I would. My, my heart's still in San Fran, as they once say, Randy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey, uh, before we get to the hockey part of things, and wasn't wasn't great last night, but uh, Michelle Smallman always said, because her family's from New Jersey, that it was the water in uh, bagels in Jersey that made the great bagels there. Have you heard that? And it, is it similar? Is the water a big part of the the bread in San Francisco and the bagels in Jersey? It is. So water water is actually very important. And you know what? People in St. Louis, we we need to be really grateful. The, the the water from our faucet in St. Louis, and I don't know the exact reason why, but it is very very good drinking water. And I know this because. So my good friend Kui, have you guys ever been to Noodle House down the street from you guys? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. So Noodle House. So Kui, Kui is the most. He's the most fantastic. I mean, fantastic ramen guy I've ever met and fall guy. Uh, you, you, ever, you ever imagine? And he's got the Noodle House, right? He's also got Mai Lee. That was his original shop. But but Noodle House, when he was starting this, you know, Mai Lee was more of a pho place. P H O, uh, not pho for all you people out there. It's actually pronounced pho. <laughs> and uh, so he started Noodle House, and he wanted to do a kind of a ramen, a ramen twist. Uh, to a new restaurant, and, and it's a wonderful shop. Again, it's just on the street from you guys. They're off of Olive. And what he did is he he got one of these, like, ramen gurus. I think he was from Japan, and he basically flew him over as a consultant to St. Louis, and he was making the best ramen in Japan. So he brings this guy over, and the first thing this kind of, like, Mr. Miyagi of ramen looks at is he, he pours water from the St. Louis faucet, and he does all kinds of tests with it. And he was extremely impressed by the pH level and the different um, acidic levels of our, our, our water here. And he said that is the most important thing when it comes to ramen is the, the, the gauge of how much quality is in your water. And, and to kind of turn this back into New York, New York in the same way has a very good pH scale water where for dough and for yeast fermentation, it is actually very favorable uh, you, need, you need, need to be leaning more away from the acidic side of things. Uh, and that's where that balance of the New York and New Jersey bagels, it is definitely without a doubt a huge part of why the, the bagels in New York or in New Jersey are just, just is very, very different. And you really can't mimic them unless you have that New York water. And then, of course, the New York air, because we know uh, as well with dough, it's, it's a lot of live yeast and bacteria, which is kind of floating around the air. And, and that's where... And that's where it's so specific to that area. And for for people out there who think I'm crazy, you know, your grandma would make a loaf of bread or some pizza uh, or muffins. And then she would give you the exact same recipe. And you remember from your childhood, my grandma made the best bread or the best raisin bread or whatever it was. She'd give me the recipe and what happens every time. It never turns out quite like grandma. And it's because because grandma had a specific, specific brand of yeast and bacteria in her hand. 
that when she's mixing it, it would just cater to what what it meant to her. And that's where even though you get recipes and formulas from your old the old timers, it never quite comes out the same. That's amazing. Great. So you always learn something new from Joe Vitale here. I learned so much from you, Joe. I, I really do. I, I appreciate all of your wealth of knowledge. Well, I guess I will get into some Blues talk here because we have to talk about what happened last night for the Blues. And even these past two games, I found it very interesting that Drew Bannister keeps pointing to the lack of effort that he has seen from this group. What are you seeing from them, Joey? Yeah, it's been two games. It's been two games in a row. I, I would have hoped for a better response last night for St. Louis after the Philly game a few days ago where, you know, his comments after the game were we weren't ready. Uh, we lacked a little passion. We lacked a little bit of urgency in our game. And you, you think by comments like that, the, the team will right the ship the following game. And unfortunately, I think it was almost a mirror image of what it was in the Philly game, of course, last night in that Washington Capitals game. You know, I think the, the disturbing thing and the hard, hard part is that the Blues are coming out slow. That, that's what's frustrating. You know, I think that third period, they started to find a little bit of juice and momentum. You know, after they get that third period goal there by Nathan Walker from, from Justin Falk from the outside, they make it four to two, and here they come. A couple, couple waves, a couple good shifts, but it's just too little too late, and they found themselves in such a big hole being down by three goals. They really can't. They really can't come back. You know, the system that Drew Bannister has certainly implemented is a very defensive style of the structure, right? It is a in the offensive zone. You watch it. The, the forward, the third man, is very high. It's a very conservative style. It is a very defensive first style, and they're learning and he's trying to get these guys to understand that we have to defend first and then wait for our opportunities. Well, I will say about this uh, this type of style, especially with a lot of veterans and guys who want to score. If you don't win games and you're not winning games and you're not scoring and you're not patiently waiting for those opportunities, this is where players can get a little bit impatient. This is where guys uh, kind of fall off the radar and then you stop thinking about you know, maybe the system because you know you're not really manufacturing a lot. And that's that's where this is kind of a it's a touchy it's a touchy game that Drew Banister is playing because. You want to play a good defensive structure, and you want to keep guys high in a good position. But if you're not scoring, then then that's where internally as a hockey player you start getting really frustrated, and then you start cheating for offense. So that's where it's a very tough line where I think Drew Bannister's coaching style and, of course, the players have got to get on the same page with this style because when it looks good, it looks really good. I mean, when Drew Bannister came in, this is what he's implemented, and it was a patient game. Think of all the two-to-one games of Blues won. They were patient, they were defensive, they were structured, and they basically just outweighed the other team into the third period. But the last two games, it almost seems like the opposite. It seems like they got impatient early on in that game, and Philly and, of course, Washington Capitals, and they've been two tough losses. And you look at the St. Louis team, they were just three games above 500 looking for four, and all of a sudden, snap of a finger after two games, you're right back down to uh, just one game over 500 again. Joey, I was watching closely the second period, and I, I don't like to rip on referees or umpires. It's a hard job. The game is fast. However, there is the pure entertainment factor of being a sports fan and watching games. W what did you think of that second period? And just it was lethargic. It was kind of, you know, start, stop, those kind of things. And just the entertainment factor for a hockey fan. Yeah, I mean, listen, it was – sometimes you kind of got to scratch your head at, you know, uh, how things are evolving. You know, I think the penalties uh, – certainly a penalty-filled second period. Um, Dan, to your point, you know, the penalties to me were because of – at the foundation of it all was – I think both teams were not really fast teams, but they're not really moving their feet. When you're not moving your feet, you find yourself using your stick as a weapon a lot. Uh, that, that That's where it comes down to. I think that, you know, some of the hooks, we saw high stick, we saw a couple trips – from both sides, that is. I mean, it was both both sides. And I think that when you're not moving your feet and you're a slower team, uh, like like last night the Blues were and certainly the Capitals are, I think that's where you're going to see a lot more stick infractions. You know, and I think this is where, you know, Drew Bannister, he, he, he's kind of jumped around and moved some bodies around. He's trying to find secondary scoring. He's trying to find uh, some more chemistry. And, again, this is a, a touchy subject where it, it's kind of a second-guessing game for a head coach because you have all the scoring, the eliteness, with Kairou, Bucinavich, and Thomas on this top line. But if that line is not producing every single game, you've got to break up that party because, meanwhile, on the second and third line, you know, you need some of that score and you need some of that speed from Kairou. You need some of the playmaking from Bucinavich. So, you know, that, that line got away from scoring for a little bit. 
And I think that they moved them down. And I think in some ways they moved them back to that third period to try to get create, create a little bit more chemistry. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is a Blues team, uh, to your point, Dan, that this isn't a team that really is going to thrive on a special teams battle. This is a five-on-five team. You need everyone involved. You need the fourth line clicking like they were last night. You need to play with speed. You need to play with pace. And, you know, this penalty certainly is a struggle for St. Louis where their power play, although they've been good for the four games leading up to last night's game, uh, was not was not superb at all. And then the PK wasn't good enough there as well. You know, you got Marco Scandella out. Don't, keep in mind, Robert Bortuzzo got dealt a couple months ago. He's one of your best penalty killers as well. So missing a couple of bodies there on the kill, and it certainly hurt him last night. I, I was uh, saying earlier in the show, I would have thrown anybody out there on on the power play. I just said, okay, I'm reaching in a hat. You guys are going out there, and these are the five I'm going with. It was, I think, I think, I'm dead serious I, about that. I really think, and I, Curves and I mentioned that right at the end of the second period, right as the second intermission was starting. You know, you know, Chris Gerber said, hey, you know, Joe, what are your thoughts on what are your thoughts on this for a power play? And I said, I think if we see another power play. I think you're going to see Nathan Walker. I think you're going to see Coach yes. I think Dubanser answer is just going to say, the next five, just go. You guys, you five that are going, just go. And you play it like a normal shift, and you just play it with pace. You play it without numbering. You play it with just getting pucks to the net. And you'd be surprised how you can have success through that. And, you know, I think that, you know, we didn't see any penalties in the third period, but I still do believe, I think Drew Bannister would have switched things up uh, if, if given the opportunity because it was just so stagnant and second-guessing, you know, and this comes down to personnel, Dan, where I think Drew Bannister is continually looking for chemistry. So you keep moving guys in and out. You have Falk on the top unit. Then you move it to Pareko. Then you move it back to Falk. Then you got two defensemen and Prunovich and Krug on the second unit. You know, so different bodies are moving around, which is good because you want to find chemistry. But the bad thing about this is, you know, all the best power plays in the league, They've been together a long time. You think about the Boston Bruins power play with Marchand and Pasternak. Look at that Colorado Avalanche power play with McKinnon and Ranton. I mean, these guys have been together so long. They know exactly what the next player is going to do, the move, two, three moves before they're going to make them. And that just comes with being together a long time. But the problem is with, with St. Louis right now is they're not getting a lot of success consistently. So you've got to keep moving bodies in and out. But that certainly does affect the chemistry. And it, it affects what, what the player next to you is going to be doing, which, of course, is anticipation. And that's all the playmaking really comes down to. Joey, when you go out and run on Friday morning and it's 10 degrees, do your lungs sting? They sting in the best way, Randy. I mean, listen, right now uh, it, it burns, it hurts. But you know, you know what burns and hurts more? waking up with five kids and having to do breakfast and they're fighting over toys. So, you know, as much as it burns, as much as it burns, I think it still burns my wife a little bit more. All right, good. I'm, and you, so obviously you got to run in this morning. Of course, n- not nonstop. Every Friday, you know that. I know. Mm-hmm. You're the best. Joey V, have a great weekend. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. See ya. See you later. That's Joe Vitale. You can hear him tomorrow as the Blues take on the Washington Capitals over at Enterprise Center. 6 o'clock pregame, 7 o'clock faceoff here on 101 ESPN. Coming up, we've got a fighter for the fight already. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Gary's back. Looking forward to that. Gary, our guy, is next on 101 ESPN. <laughs>
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Blues fall to the Capitals 5 2 behind the strength of a TJ Oshie hat trick. They'll be back in action hosting the Washington Capitals at Enterprise Center on Saturday night. It's a 7 p.m. puck drop. You can catch up the pregame show right here on 101 ESPN starting at 6 p.m. Last night, local college basketball, number 14th ranked Fighting Illini, get a big conference victory, 88-73 over Michigan. That is your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling, an independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. To the opening drive. Brooke Grimsley here alongside Danny Mac, Randy Carricker, and Matthew Rocchio. And it is time for the fight. And for the first time, Dan, in 23 tries, Long we time. are bringing back a fighter, Gary. Ooh, yeah. Gary, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Uh, just wonder if I can give a quick shout out. Of course. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to shout out to my uh, other half of my sports trivia brain trust, Mr. Tom Baker, and then uh, also to everyone up there in the Oakland PD Detective Bureau that's listening to today. Oh, and nice. I can do them proud. So, Gary, did you get a lot of uh, reaction from you <laughs> winning the fight yesterday? I did. I did. It was, uh, you know, pretty popular. Everybody was pretty shocked. So, uh, hopefully, I can keep this streak going. There you go. All right, you ready to take on Randy in the fight? I'm as ready as I'm gonna be. Question number one, Gary. Who was the starting quarterback for the 49ers before Joe Montana? Was it Scott Bull, Jim Plunkett, or Steve DeBerg? Uh, let's go Steve DeBerg. Okay, question two. Mike Yo won one playoff series in his time as head coach of the Blues. First round of the 2017 playoffs after taking over for Ken Hitchcock midseason. Who did the Blues beat four games to one in that 2017 series? Was it the Minnesota Wild, Nashville Predators, or the L.A. Kings? I believe that was the former team, the Minnesota Wild. Who is the last off-ball linebacker to win NFL Defensive Player of the Year? Was it Levante David, Brian Erlacher, or Luke Keekley? Uh, I think it's going to be Keekley. And question four. Happy birthday to gold medal winner Al Joyner. In which event did Joyner win his gold medal at the 1984 Olympics? Long jump, triple jump, 100 meters sprint. Huh. Well, let's see, I've been about three years old, so I'm going <laughs> to that one out. Uh, let's go with the 100 meter sprint. Okay. Nice work, Gary. Nice work. We're going to have to make sure and see if Randy brings that lunch pail and ready to go to work on you. Let's see. Oh, yeah. And riding high off of yesterday, you mentioned, so do you do a lot of sports trivia? Do you have a group that you play with a lot? Uh, well, we, we, it's a lot of uh, trivia between each other. <laughs> nice. Oh, here's Randy. Randy. Randy, say good morning again to Gary. Gary, good morning. How are you doing? Hey, not bad, Randy. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for listening. Thanks for playing. Congratulations on yesterday, and best of luck today. You, uh, you as well. Thank you, sir. You guys don't mean it. <laughs> no, Let's be no, honest. Does. No, you don't. You guys don't mean it. Brooke, question one. Let's go. Question number one, Randy. Who, <laughs> <Okay>. was, <laughs> who was the starting quarterback for the 49ers before Joe Montana? Um... He was like the ultimate placeholder. Did you know that Joe Montana's first NFL start was here in St. Louis in 1979, I believe? I saw him play when he was with the Chiefs. Went I to Arrowhead too. and yeah. went, went and watched that. Pretty cool. It was. Uh, so the, the uh, he, he was like America's placeholder. Whenever somebody would draft a number one pick, Steve DeBerg, well, and obviously the, uh, Montana was a third rounder, but Steve DeBerg, was the placeholder for Vinny Testaverde nice. with uh, the the Buccaneers and uh, somebody else had uh, might have even been Elway. He was uh, the the placeholder for Elway too. So Steve DeBerg would have been the guy. Question two: Mike Yo won one playoff series in his time as head coach of the Blues. Did you know that, Randy? I did not know that, Dan. In the first round of the 2017 playoffs, after taking over for Ken Hitchcock midseason, who did the Blues beat four games to one in that 2017 series? 
So before losing to Minnesota, his old team, I think they beat Brooks Nishfield Predators. I think they beat Nishfield. Uh, and then uh, it was not as good after that. I think they lost to many. I think that's the way it worked. Question number three. Who is the last off-ball linebacker to win NFL Defensive Player of the Year? Can you describe off-ball to me, please? He's not a pass rusher. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I would say that that would probably be... Let's see. Let's think about this. Um... Well, in the in, in the uh, essence of time, Brooke, why don't we just do the uh, the old lifeline here? Okay, Levante David, Brian Erlacher, or Luke Keekley. I think I'm going to do go with Luke Keekley. Final answer, Randall. Final answer. Happy birthday to gold medal winner Al Joyner. In which event did Joyner win his gold medal at the 1984 Olympics? Uh, if you aren't aware of it, Al Joyner is the brother of Jackie Joyner, Kersey. And uh, they are uh, quite the athletic family. Yeah. Uh, Al was a triple jumper, I believe, that allowed him to, uh, to win the gold medal in L.A., if I'm not mistaken. Also the husband of Flojo. That's right. Florence Griffith <laughs> Joyner. Um, we have a tie for the first time in a long time here on the fight. <laughs> and so we will go into our tiebreaker, and the rules here are pretty simple. I will read out the question. We will then give Randy Carricker a moment to write down his answer. Then we will get Gary's answer audibly. We'll double-check Randy Carricker's answer. And then whoever is closest to the pin is the winner of today's fight. Gary, do you understand those rules? I do. Randy, do you understand the rules? I do, sir. Do you have a pen? I have a pen. All right, here we paper. go. <laughs> Muggsy Bogues is listed as the shortest player to ever play in the NBA. In feet and inches, how tall is Muggsy Bogues according to his basketball reference profile? Muggsy Bogues is listed as the shortest player to ever play in the NBA. In feet and inches, how tall is Muggsy Bogues according to his basketball reference profile? We have an answer from Randy Carricker. Gary, what is your answer? Uh, I'm gonna go with five foot six. Gary answered five foot six. Randy Carricker, you're holding up your answer to the camera now for the Air Alliance team uh, members who are watching on that camera. But who uh, can you say it audibly, please? I said he was five five. So five six from Gary, five five from Randy. Little fella. Muggsy. So the question here is. Is he shorter than 5'5"? Five five? Is he 5'5 five five exactly? Is he taller than 5'6"? Is he 5'6 five exactly? Those are pretty much the only four parameters we go on this one. Which one is it? Who is the winner of today's fight? Ring that bell. The winner and still champion of the fight, Randy Carricker. Oh, forgot how to do this. <laughs> I forgot oh, how unbelievable. To do that. I'm so sorry, Gary. Muggsy Bogues <laughs> listed yes. five foot three, the shortest Ooh. player to ever play wow. in the NBA. Randy Carricker beats you on that one because he, he had the one that was lower. I'm sorry about that. Uh, that's good. I almost went with five five. I decided to go with five six. But... <laughs> yeah, you, know, you want to tie and the next tiebreaker question would have been really interesting. I can't wait to add that one next. So let's go through the questions and go through the answers. It was a three three tie, by the way, between Gary and Randy. The starting quarterback for the 49ers before Joe Montana was in fact Steve DeBerg. Mike Yo won one playoff series. Randy, you just got to twist it around. He beat yeah. the Wild, then they lost to the Nashville Predators. Yeah. Last off ball linebacker to win the NFL Defensive Player of the Year is in fact Luke Keekley. It should have been Levante David, but I won't go on that. And happy birthday to Goldman. Winner Al Joyner. In which event did Joyner win his gold medal at the 84 Olympics? It was, in fact, the triple jump. His sister won a lot of uh, medals with the long jump, and his wife won a gold medal in the 100 meter sprint. So the triple jump, though, for Al Joyner. A 3 3 tie, and then, of course, the winner in the tiebreaker for Randy Carricker. Gary, thank you so much for joining the show and joining the fight the last two days. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, Gary, again, thanks for what you do for the community. Be safe out there and have a good weekend. Will do. Thank you, sir. Uh, take care. Gary with us on 101 ESPN. He's a detective mm -hmm. and uh, obviously is uh, working hard to make sure that we're all safer. He did a great job. Yes, he yeah, did. he really did. He's proud of him. Really did. To win and then force a tiebreaker, that's tough. That was good. And be, one inch, and be one inch away from it. I mean, come on. Yeah, 5'3". Yep. Man. Little, little guy. <laughs> I'm telling you. Five, now, what if he could dunk? Could he dunk? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Muggsy? Yeah. I, really? I don't know if I'm confusing... Muggsy Bogues dunks. Spud, Spud Webb Web dunks. I think Spud, Spud Webb dunks. I don't know if Muggsy Bogues ever dunked. I thought he did. Anyway, go coming up. Uh, coming up, what you talking about? It's a new segment. We've got a, a great creative co-host here in uh, Brooke Grimsley, and uh, she's got a fun one for us next on 101 ESPN.
What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? What you talking about? What the hell are you talking about? What you talking about? Do you actually listen to yourself when you speak, or do you find you drift in and out? What you talking about? Bro, I'm out, man. Welcome back to the opening drive. Brooke Grimsley here alongside Randy Carricker and Danny Mack and Matthew Rocchio. And guys, I was trying to think of a new segment. And there are so many good sound bites and interviews that go around on social media that go viral for all of the wrong reasons. So I thought about, what about this segment? They said, what? Where you listen to that mm-hmm. sound bite and you're a little bit confused afterwards. And maybe they meant something different. But how about we start here? In light of the Packers facing the 49ers this weekend, ex Packers tight end Mark Chimura, while on his radio show in Milwaukee, ruffled a lot of feathers with his proposed game plan for Green Bay when they face Brock Purdy. And this is what he had to say about what he thinks that they should do. But Gabe, I go back and it's little things like this. And the reason we won in 95 when no one gave us a chance in San Francisco is because we intimidated them. I mean, if you, and I always revert to Wayne Simmons, Wayne Simmons kicked the crap out of Brent Jones. And then it got contagious and then it carried over. That's why, you guys are going to think I'm crazy. Well, we already thought Uh, that, so go ahead. A 15-yard penalty and I don't condone this, but I kind of do in the playoffs. <laughs> um, a 15-yard penalty for a late hit on Brock Purdy is not a bad thing, as long as it's worth it. I, I'm just saying, this but, is so the mindset you go time. into when it's battle. And it's it's kind of like the reverse of hockey. What don't they do in hockey in the playoffs, Joshy? Shave their beards? That and one other thing. They don't fight. They don't fight. Correct. They don't fight. Right? This is kind of like sometimes a 15 yard penalty is worth it early in the game if you knock the living crap out of the guy. And then he kind of like sticking your helmet in the ribs of Nick Bosa is like, ah, but that I'm hearing ghosts. Well, his comments are being debated and rightfully so, right? He's not wrong about Wayne Simmons, what he said there. Is Mark Chamorro with what he's saying or Chewy? wrong in what he's saying or did he just say the quiet part out loud which is a lot of players are thinking it they just don't say it or admit to it out loud every one of them is thinking that (laughs) i would say that every one of them is saying you know what if we can get a hit on this guy or that guy and take them out of the game yeah and like he said he said i don't condone this no you do no you do and you do and so do other players are to play this weekend. If everything else is equal, I would condone it too. But I would suggest that every time the Packers are able to hit Brock Purdy, it's going to be late because they aren't getting to him before he gets rid of the ball. They just aren't good enough. They Against that San Francisco offensive line, those Packer defenders, uh, unless they're just blitzing, uh, sending seven on every play, it's not going to happen. And tell me what player on the Packers is going to provide shivers to Nick Bosa what what player on the Packers any player of on their roster of, of their 53 is going to be able to provide a shiver to Nick Bosa and every coach is saying play it to the whistle and by the way if the whistle is there and you wind up finishing a hit or a tackle eh, okay they're all going to be doing that they're all going to be trying to take yeah. out some of the special guys that are on that field right it's just that's part of the game that's what happens and oh by the way a team like the 49ers they'll go all biblical if you put a hit on if you put a hit on brock purdy guess what's going to happen to jordan love it's not going to go over well so do you guys disagree with what he said because it's it's gotten a lot of negative attention one of demarco's favorite lines was first 15s on me boys (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) exactly yeah so no you you do that to get everybody fired up and uh and maybe you can knock somebody out of the game i just don't think the packers are good enough to do that i I think your teams have to be relatively equal and you have to have an intimidating person Mm -hmm. i don't think that they have intimidating people on the packers at this stage you just don't say it publicly you know, oh, you know, you just don't say, no. "Well, we're looking to, play, oh, to no. put a late hit on Brock Purdy." No, you're not going to say it publicly. Well, but guys like Mark Chamura can do it, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, because he's doing a podcast. So who cares what he thinks? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I like the thought process. Sure, 
Uh, is this yeah, being said in every locker room this week? Oh, yeah. 100%. Right. It really is. Then also, if you guys saw this past weekend, the Lions fans didn't exactly have a warm welcome back for Matthew Stafford and his family, including his children. Kelly Stafford, she has her own podcast. It's called The Morning After. That sounds familiar. With Kelly <laughs> Stafford and Hank. And she talked about her and her children getting booed on the sidelines at that Lions game. I took it as a teaching moment for my children, you know, yeah. in tears. Sawyer is like, mommy, I, and Sawyer looks at me smart. Sawyer's just smart, guys. She goes, I go, guys, they're not booing you. They are not booing you. They are booing mommy. They're very passionate and excited about this game. They want their Lions to win. Mm -hmm. We are on the other team. Yep. And you know what? We just, we're going to move on because there's also fans in there that are cheering, that yep. are saying thank you. And, yep. but we're not hearing that over, the louder ones. Yeah. And Sawyer looked at me and she goes, but we're not playing the sport. Literally, that came out of her mouth. And I said, and that is very true, Sawyer. But mom, and like you said, I go, mommy's been involved with a lot of things here. Yeah. And that's what they are booing. They are not booing you. They are yeah. not booing your sisters. They're booing some of the things that have gone on in the past. And we just have to move and we have to move past it. Mm -hmm. And we have to focus on the good. She didn't deny that she expected her and her husband to be booed, but her issue is that her children. So are family members off the table when it comes to booing? 100%. Yes. I, I agree. 100%. Yeah. I remember talking to Jason Isringhausen yep. multiple mm -hmm. times, and when you're a closer in baseball, you either do or you don't. You either get the save or you blow the game. And I know at times there were fans that were very tough on his family. And I don't. I, I think if you buy a ticket, you can boo, you can scream, you can get up and cheer, you can dance, you can do all that stuff. Can't throw things. And I also think that off limits are family members. Yeah, I, I agree. Now, if it's just Kelly Stafford, who, by the way, has taken her shots at that state in the past. Yes, and she said yeah. she's fine with that. Yes. If, if she brought it on herself, and she did then it's different, but never for kids. And if it is just an innocent bystander spouse or a significant other, then no. But if somebody went out of their way to say something derogatory about your state, then I, I think you do open yourself up for criticism and uh, vocal, not abuse, but vocal catcalls by the other franchise. She was pretty rough on the city, too, was yeah. she not? Yep. She was. Wanted yes. to trade out of the out of the city, That's wanted to go to the West thing. Coast, yep. all those things, which would frustrate any hometown fan. I get that. I wonder where they were sitting. You know, there's the she family. Said they were on the sideline. So oh, the, so they're on the sideline. Yeah, they were. So they were walking the sidelines, and I don't know if you saw too her little girls. I did they were, see that, yeah. but that was prior to the game, right? And that's what she's talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm guessing they were probably in a wives' suite of some sort, and maybe there was some more booing. But either way, I think that it was more directed at her rather than her children, probably. Absolutely. Well, and they she were just could have gotten the last it. word by having her husband lead them to a victory. Oh, oh, oh. We can't talk about that. Well, speaking of yeah. things that people probably want to boo, did you guys see that Blues game last night? Mm -hmm. Has the new coach magic worn off now for the Blues? We're going to discuss that next coming up here on 101 ESPN. Hey, if you are 
coming home after maybe going shopping this weekend, and we've had all of this really cold weather in St. Louis, and you notice that your gutters have broken. You know, sometimes you get water into the gutters, and it freezes, and it expands, and your gutters break. You need new gutters. You need to get in touch with my friend at Gutter Pros. Gutterpros.com is where to go to set your appointment, or you can give them a call, 314-656-7195. But a lot of times, if your downspouts are clogged up or you have leaves, the water actually expands in your gutters, and it causes them to break. And you don't want that to happen, but, heck, you need new gutters. Gutter Pros is the company to call. A veteran St. Louis company, they'll come out to your house, provide you a free estimate and no pressure they're just going to say here's what we would put on your house we'll add some leaf guard if you want you can add it if you want we can also do soffit and fascia we do great work gutter pros does do amazing work and you'll love them go to gutterpros.com learn more about what they do and make your appointment today gutter pros where water goes where we tell it the biggest sports stories of the day on the opening drive with a rush hour reset. The Blues fall last night to the Washington Capitals by a score of 5-2. to two. The Blues and Caps will play tomorrow night, 6 o'clock pregame, 7 o'clock faceoff here on 101 ESPN. And after getting off to a 7-1 and one start under new coach Drew Bannister, the Blues now have lost to the Panthers, and then they beat the Rangers before losing in overtime to the Bruins, lost to the Flyers, lost to the Caps. So after that hot start, it has not been as productive for the Blues. And you wonder if the shine has kind of worn off the new coach, if the, the shine of our new coach bump isn't what it has been so far, for example, with the Edmonton Oilers. It sadly seems that way. That's what feels like is happening right now. The whole purpose, it felt like with Craig Berube and that firing is because maybe he wasn't able to maximize the most out of this, this group. Army mentioned that sometimes the message is not getting through to the players anymore. Maybe his message had grown stale. And you see coach turnover so much in the NHL. And with Drew Bannister, I think that he was, he is good at connecting with young players. And that was the purpose of this. But right now, it, this group is just, it is what it is with them. Yeah, this maybe, is who they are. Maybe we should have just expected this. Expectation shouldn't have been as maybe as high as some wanted when uh, Drew Bannister took over and they started winning games. I also think it's a product of the schedule that they played. And mm -hmm. when you play these tough teams, you do see the talent gap. And right now there is a talent gap from the upper echelon, upper tier teams to what the Blues are right now. Five and one in the first six to three and six in the last nine, including losses in your last three in overtime to Boston and then to the Flyers and then to the Washington Capitals. Now, what is inexcusable, though, was like the second period, really the better part of the entire game was how lethargic that they played and that your top players essentially didn't show up. I mean, there just wasn't anything that was of a positive impact that they made. And the other part that he's gotten going better was the power play and the power play and the penalty kill were not very good last night. No. no. And Special the teams. Good. No. And that's what I don't understand is how did we get to this point effort-wise? Because it is up to the players to execute at the end of the day. You heard Drew Bannister say that in his postgame that effort wasn't there. So what is it with this 
group? Is this just a group that doesn't have the chemistry? Do they not have that want to? What is it that is going wrong with them? Don't have the players. Yeah, that's a big part of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and that, but the want to is a big part of it too because there are a lot of moments where they just appear to be non-competitive. Yeah, I would say so too. I, you know, again, I, I've said this a couple of times today though, but Robert Thomas over 25 minutes was kind of non-existent mm -hmm. on the ice last night. Shen, ton of chances, couldn't bury him. You looked at Kevin Hayes, one shot. Saad, one shot. Cairo, two shots. Power play, 0 for 5, which also included a four-minute power play in the first. They had one scoring chance in the second period. On a couple of power plays in the second period, they had a total of five shots. I mean... That, that's just not going to cut it. Nope. You know, it doesn't matter who you're playing. You're not going to win. No. And the lack of physicality, that's very, very alarming. Lack of hits that you saw from the Blues, that just shows that you're not only wanting to do that for yourself, because if you're skating, you should be hitting, right? Mm -hmm. There should be that physicality there. But then you're also not wanting to do that for your teammates. Who do you guys think is the person in that locker room right now where when you have a performance like this, who's, who's going around the room saying, hey, guys, we got to do better. We got to firing them up. Who is that guy in the locker room There's right no now? doubt that it's Braden Shen. It has to be Braden Shen. If he's wearing the C, it's got to yeah. be him. But, and he's got the personality, but I don't know if there are enough players in that room willing to hold themselves accountable to help the team win. So if, if you're out-talented and you're outworked, that's a really bad combination. That'll lead to a three-game losing streak. I don't know about you guys, but when I was watching the game, one of the things I did enjoy was anytime he was on the ice was watching Ovechkin and mm -hmm. what he might yeah. do. I mean, I just watched... Where he was on the ice, what may happen, I, I think he made an impact, too, on their power play because you pay so much attention to Ovechkin, it opens up other lanes. And we saw that a couple of times for now 37-year-old mm -hmm. TJ Oshie. But, man, is Ovechkin fun to watch. I know he's not the same player he was. Father time is undefeated. But, man... What a fun player to watch. Meanwhile, news this morning, Alabama, since Nick Saban retired, has seen 20 players, more than 20, go into the transfer portal. And the number one quarterback recruit, number three overall this year, Julian Sayan, this morning entered the transfer portal. He had left high school early. He had started classes at Alabama on the first day of classes in the second semester. And his first day of classes coincided with the day of Nick Saban's retirement. So Sayan, who was obviously as the number one quarterback in this class, very heavily recruited, gets a chance to use his one-time transfer portal option right now. And by the way, Julian Sayan, if he doesn't have a brother named Justin, shame on his parents. <laughs> cause, cause he, there's got to be a brother named J J Just Sayan, right? You oh, have that's to. Funny. You have to capitalize on that. <laughs> that's uh, 22 players now. 22 wow. Alabama players that have gone to the transfer portal. They've also had six different recruits decommit. So nearly 30 players. You're talking about a massive part of your roster in the future and of the and the now. When you talk about the transfer portal, man, that's that's a lot of kids leaving that program now that Nick Saban has left. I don't know what to expect about what Alabama will look like this year. Do you give them a pass of growing pains transition, or is the expectation always going to be, despite this huge change that they're going through, that they should still be Alabama out there? Here's the thing. They can lose all of these four- and five-star guys and still have twice as many four- and five-star guys yeah. as Mizzou has. And the expectations are always going to be big, whether yeah. Nick Saban is there or not. But it's... It's one of those situations where if you're a fan and being realistic, which is hard to be, it, it, to see what <laughs> he is going to be like, DeBoer coming in, and he hasn't recruited the South. Mm -hmm. He hasn't recruited that part of the country. He's bringing in his own system, his own coaching staff. It's completely different than Nick Saban. If you're a fan, you have to be realistic and say, I'm going to mm -hmm. give the guy a little grace period. Yeah. Ooh. Just like at LSU, they had to do that for Nick Saban. He, he walked into LSU in the exact same situation. Yeah. Never recruited the South, never been in the SEC. He had been a Midwest guy. He kind of figured it out at LSU and won a championship. Yeah, it worked out pretty well. Yeah. I don't think that you can put Alabama fan and realistic in the <laughs> same not. sentence. Just, just to be fair, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him, especially with this new 12-team format. If, Al if Alabama doesn't get into that, then that's a huge giant disappointment and there will be anarchy in Alabama. Now if you're a Missouri fan you're saying this is great news. It is. Nick Saban is done. He's retired. They've got all these kids that are transferring out. They're going through the portal. They're having recruits that are decommitting and uh, by the way Mizzou plays at Tuscaloosa this season and a lot of 
a lot of the so-called experts looked at that as being the lone loss potentially for Mizzou next year. The schedule is very favorable for Mizzou going into that game. I want to get Caleb Downs, by the way. If I can get one of the Alabama guys, I want the true freshman safety who was a second-team All-American. He's pretty good. Mm-hmm. I don't uh, I don't think he'll wind up in uh, at Mizzou. Apparently, Ohio State is all over Caleb Downs, and they're so, willing to pay big money for him. Ohio State, there was... Uh, Somebody telling me the other day that it really follows us closely, that the amount of talent that they have coming in, that they would be the preseason number one going into next year, just because of the amount of players that they're getting through the transfer portal. Just talent across the board. The the NIL has changed everything. Sure has. They gave gave a million and a half dollars to Quinn Ewers, and he played seven snaps for them. (laughs) They don't care. And kind of like Missouri, but on a different level because Ohio State is Ohio State. When you're drawing funds from not only Columbus, which is the biggest city in the state. You're talking about Arch Manning, not Quinn Ewers. No, Quinn, when, when Quinn Ewers went to Ohio State, he played seven snaps oh, and got a million yeah, and a half I got months. you now, yeah. Because at that time, the laws hadn't been changed in Texas to allow players right. to get paid. Right, okay. So he always knew he was going to go to Texas once the rules changed. Mm-hmm. But. Ohio State has so much money that he thought, well, I'll just go there. I'm at Ohio State. He played seven snaps, got a million and a half bucks, and then after his first year there, transfers to Texas, where he always wanted to be anyway. Does that bother you guys? It doesn't bother me. I, I think it's great that the players are making the money. Playing the game. It was yeah. already happening. Did you watch that whole Johnny Manziel documentary on Netflix? It's It's been happening. We all know that it was happening behind the scenes. It's just now right in front of us, clear as day. I saw that one where uh, with, with Shaq, that, uh, that documentary called The Program. <laughs> the movie, the program. The yeah. How stupid now when we look back at the Reggie Bush situation that the Heisman was taken yes. away from him. Ridiculous. It Ridiculous. is. Yes. So anyway, let's get Caleb Downs to Missouri. And then what I was going to say is Cincinnati and Cincinnati and Cleveland are both paying into Ohio State, too. In addition to Columbus, they've got a lot of NIL money there. A ton of money. That's your Rush Hour Reset here on 101 ESPN. Coming up, who are your core members of this St. Louis Blues roster? Get your text in to the Air Comfort Service. Text line 314-399-9646. 314-399-YOHO. And we'll give you our ideas next on 101 ESPN. Hey everyone, it's Brooke here, and I want to tell you why I love the Missouri Athletic Club so much. This year, I set two really big goals for myself, to get back into tennis and also to get in great shape for my big wedding day coming up in June. And thanks to everyone over at the Missouri Athletic Club, I'm already off to a great start to my two big goals. Just this week, I went and started working with Scott on my tennis game. It was the first time I had been out on a court in like two years, and he was super helpful. And yesterday, I went and worked back out with Christine and to really start 
start my personal training journey. We set a lot of goals and she also helped me with nutrition and was just really attentive to everything that I needed and what I'm looking to accomplish. Everyone over there has been so kind and so helpful So make to make sure I get off to my great start to 2024 and I feel like I'm really joining a community over there. That's my MAC. They always provide a wonderful experience and that's why I love the Missouri Athletic Club so much. Five questions about the Blues retool, core, trades, prospects, coaches, and cap. And one of the questions, the first question is, who's in the Blues core? And Jeremy writes, how do you define the core? There are probably a few ways, including who are the Blues building around? That's fair, but here's how I'm going to narrow it down. Who unequivocally do you think will still be wearing the team's uniform in three years? And Jeremy writes, quote, I'm going to list two players, Robert Thomas and Colton Pareko. I don't disagree with those two, especially with their contract situations, but I'm going to put Jake Neighbors in there. I think the Blues think enough of, and uh, Doug Armstrong thinks enough of Jake Neighbors that he would also join the Blues core to be with the squad in three years. That would make some sense. you got to keep some of that grit at the back end of your team and a fourth-line guy. That would make some sense. I hadn't thought about that. I would look at uh, Robert Thomas as being part of my core. Mm -hmm. Jordan Bennington is part of my core. And as you mentioned, Pareko will only be 33 Mm -hmm. at the time that this would end for his contract. So maybe he's part of the core, too, looking forward. What about Pavel Buchnevich? That is one player that I have enjoyed watching ever since his time here because I feel like he brings a lot of that passion and something that is very important for the Blues. Is he part of that conversation? Because I think he's kind of fringe. I know that he has one more left. Uh, one season left on his contract, excuse me. Does he Is he a part of that conversation for you guys? Well, with one year left on his contract, to me, he'd be a valuable piece out there for somebody that is trying to win this year and next year. And if he is not part of your long-term plans, he'd be one of the guys I think that would be on the move. 
I think he's the most gifted player that the Blues have, but the gifts aren't always utilized mm -hmm. by Buchnevich. And I would think just because of those gifts that he'll wind up being an eight or nine million dollar player after he becomes a free agent. Uh, after next season, after 24-25. So I, I wouldn't anticipate that he'll be here. But the Blues also, they, they walk a fine line. I don't think they can afford to trade him this season unless they get a real good piece back. If we're going to talk about tearing down, I don't think the Blues can do that simply because they need to try to make the playoffs every year. If they're out of the playoffs this year, Maybe you move him, but it, it's got to be, we talked earlier about Chikrin. It's got to be for somebody that they think can help them make the playoffs in 24, 25, because the Blues are, if they don't make the playoffs, they don't make money. That's the way the organization is set up, unfortunately. And they they aren't in the business. Uh, our friends from Worldwide Technology and Enterprise and Tom Stillman, uh, the Danforth family, they aren't in this to lose money. They're in it to break even, but they aren't in it to lose money. What would be your appetite long-term with Bujanavich? Would you want to do that deal? I, I would l probably not. Me neither. I, I love him. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love his too. ability. Yeah. But I, I don't feel like I can count on him. And he's... He's 28 years old. Yeah. So after, when you sign him, that'll be the 29 through 36-year-old. Correct. Pavel mm -hmm. That's why I'm... No, Which I, always I would sours. Be, yeah. I, away I don't, from that. I can do that. And by the way, I, I have Snuggie on the way. I have That's Dvorsky why too. on the way. I have... Let's just think that either Dean or Bull Duke make it. I'm, not all of these guys are going to make it. 50-50 would be great if, if you had 50% of them make it. But... I think that he is as talented as he is a replaceable part. Now, I noticed that nobody mentioned Jordan Cairo in this core player talk. He has seven years left on his contract after the season. Would you guys be willing to move him? Who I, wants to take him? Yeah. That's, the, that's yeah. the other part of that question, right? <laughs> well, I, I would be willing to move him. Yeah, I think most people watching this season would say I'd, I'd move on from, from him. It's been disappointing. There are times in which he looks like the player that you signed for the long term, but um, I don't know, man. If he's not playing a two-way game, I don't think a lot of a lot of these organizations at that price tag would want him. He does love St. Louis, by the way, uh, but he he just needs to become a more consistent player. Yes. I I know it's unfair, probably because he is. He, he's only 25, but he's already 25. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I know that's a, a weird conundrum, but when's it going to happen for yeah. him? If it, if it hasn't happened by 25, when's it going to happen for him? We're getting some other texts in. What about Jordan Bennington? That's a name that I keep seeing over and over again. He's part of my core moving forward. Is he? Yeah, he would be part of it for sure. Uh, three years down the road, though, I'm not sure. Absolutely for this year and next. He is definitely part of my core, but... At the end of the 24, 25, at the end of the 26 season, heading into 26, 27, I'm not sure. That would be his eighth year in town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we just hit the five-year mark, which is amazing to me with Jordan Bennington. I, I can't believe he's been here five years at this level, but he has. Yeah. And he is a guy that if you moved him, I would think people around the league, teams that need a goalie, would really want a guy that's won a Stanley Cup and he's had to deal with a lot of stuff here. If you're a good team and you can put Bennington in a position to win, mm -hmm. then you've got a winner. You better be pretty sure, though, that Hofer or others mm -hmm. are ready to take the reins and move yeah. on if you're going to be a playoff right. team. Yeah, and you don't do that. That's not something that you do next this year or next because you don't know about Hofer or anybody else in the organization in terms of being a Stanley Cup a potential Stanley Cup winning goalie. And Joel Hofer is 23 years old. There's been some definitely some good flashes from him this season, but it seems like he just needs more of that consistency from him. And he's young. He's going to have time to grow into that. But I agree with you guys. I don't think he's ready, I would even say, by next year to take over the starting goalie job. And eventually you'll have Jarenko. They think that he has a chance to be pretty good. They still have Colton Ellis in the organization. I know uh, he's had some injury issues in the past, but if you can get him, I think it's him that had the injury issues, uh, get him healthy. Uh, th they've got some guys that they like the ability of. But again, for me, if that guy has his name etched in the Stanley Cup, that is a tiebreaker. That's a winner. i got to ask you this. We're going to visit with Mike Liute coming up in our next segment. You, are you involved with the Blues Hall of Fame tonight or just going? I am involved. Well, what are you doing? I, I, I'm part of the committee, okay. so I'll just be there kind of as a... <laughs> they call me a VIP. I'm, oh, I, yeah. I'm not a VIP, but I will 
I will be is there. It part, is it like the Cardinals Red Ribbon Committee? Is that how you guys yeah, do it? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so it's it's fun. It's good to be a part of that, and it's good to be, be because I have such a, an affinity for blues history, I, I'm really proud to be a part Should of it. Be. It's pretty cool. You are a VIP, Randy. I yeah. wouldn't go that far, Brooke. Yes, you are. Why, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, we're going to talk to uh, new Blues Hall of Famer Mike Leud here on the opening drive on 101 ESPN. This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Blues fall last night five to two by the strength of a Capitals TJ Oshie hat trick. They'll be back in action against those same Capitals this time at home at Enterprise Center on Saturday evening. It's a 7 p.m. puck drop. You can catch the pregame show right here on your home for the St. Louis Blues 101 ESPN, starting at 6 p.m. And last night, the Fighting Illini, number 14th in the nation, get a big win over Michigan, 88 to 73. And tonight, St. Louis back in action on their A10 schedule. They have traveled to VCU to face off against the Rams. That's a 6 p.m. tip off on ESPN. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shops 24 7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me?
Brooke Grimsley and Dan McLaughlin. I'm Randy Carricker, and looking forward to tonight at the Missouri Athletic Club, the second St. Louis Blues Hall of Fame induction. Being inducted tonight, Keith Kachuk, and posthumously, Pavel Dimitra, and the Blues' all-time leader in goalie wins, games played, minutes, saves, shots against. Mike Liut was one of the all-time great Blues and, fittingly, is going into the Hall of Fame tonight and joins us now on the Celebrity Line on 101 ESPN. Mike, congratulations. This is Randy Carricker. Thanks so much for taking some time with us this morning. Well, thank you, uh, Randy. Happy to, happy to be on the show. Well, congratulations, Mike. Just reflecting back on the beginning of your time with the Blues in that early 1980s, that was just such a talented and dominant team because of Brian Sutter, Bernie Federko, and of course because of you. How special was that group in that time? Uh, you know, it was. Uh, uh, we were all drafted at the same year. I was in college and went to the WHA, and then after the merger of the two leagues, came back to St. Louis. So. Um, you know, that was, I guess, I guess that was a, a bit of a foundation. The, the Blues had, um, you know, gone through some tough years, and um, uh, we acquired a few other players. And by the eighty eighty one season, well, you know, I, I, you know, received a lot of credit for that year. You know, we had ten forwards who scored twenty goals or more. So it was a very talented group, uh, and more importantly, uh, a group that. Um, you know, from the 79-80 season, the second half, we kind of found our 80-81 was, um, you know, a year that a lot of things, you know, clicked for us. And, um, you know, it was just a, just a great year with guys that really played for each other. And, and that's and that's clearly what it takes. And, and, of course, St. Louis saw that in 2019 when they won the Cup. I mean, same kind of thing, you know, where, you know, you just refuse to lose and, you uh, you know, you, you just find ways to win. Simply put, what does it mean for you and your family to go into the Blues Hall of Fame? Always an honor to be um, recognized. Uh, you know, we, when we do this in entertainment and, and sports, um, St. Louis is a team that, you know, drafted me, childhood uh, dream to play in the NHL. When it happens, um, you know, you, you, you don't kind of fully grasp it you know youth is wasted on the young but um, when you get to reflect back on it and particularly now because the blues have had you know they've, they've just started this uh, their hall of fame um, it was a long time ago but it's always um, you know it's always an honor it comes with a little more perspective with years um, and you're you know you're kind of just thankful to have had the opportunity to play and uh, have a little bit of success and and if it culminates with this, um, you know, you're you know, super pleased about it and, and uh, happy it happened. And, of course, you know, I have family in St. Louis. I married Marianne is from uh, Carlisle, Illinois. So a little extra special uh, flavor uh, for tonight's uh, ceremony to have all of them. You know, with me. New Blues Hall of Famer Mike Liu with us on 101 ESPN. Okay, a couple of things. Number one, I can still see Mike Crombie's goal going in <laughs> past Greg Millen in that double overtime win against Pittsburgh after the 80-81 season. You obviously were between the pipes for the Blues. What do you remember about that game? Well, it was a long game because it was double double overtime. And, and what I remember, you know, it, it was just such a brutal schedule there. And, and you know, everything that could go wrong in that series seemed to you know happen the penguins were a team that were very difficult to play in the playoffs they almost upset the islanders the following year um and uh you know it was our fifth game at seven nights we played two or three overtime games and i mean it just took a lot out of us and that's what i remember from it because we had to turn around with one day off and play another four and five. So I think that's like nine and 12 days. And, and while they do that in baseball, that's that you can't do that in hockey and survive. So it was, it was an exhilarating win um, because it was such a wide open game. Uh, but it, 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 you know, that's what I remember. It just, it, it really took a lot out of our team. And Mike, uh, I was an usher at the time, so I was well aware of the cats and the rats and the power problems at the old arena. And in the next round, remember, we had the, the power out delay against the Rangers, and that, that was bizarre. But what's your favorite memory about the weirdness of the old arena? Oh, gosh. I mean, <laughs> you know, I do remember that night because um, I 
uh, weighed out of that game because it was so hot all day. It was very warm in St. Louis, and the power was out all day. So that old barn heated up, and um, I weighed out after the game 11 pounds lighter than I weighed in for the game. And that's that's what I'm talking about. You know, we were in the middle of 9 and 12 days, and that happens. I mean, of all the things we didn't need to happen, that was the one. Um and, uh, you know, we lost that game in, in the third period, of course, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. where things are going to unravel. But, you know, the, the St. Louis Arena was, was um, I mean, it really had a great hockey vibe to it. Um, you know, St. Louis, they talk about, um, you know, the original six a lot in hockey. Well, St. Louis was the seventh team. They were part of the following six that came in. But they were the the class of that that group. And, in fact, Philly – patterned their team after the Blues uh, in their initial success, and they went on to win the Stanley Cup. And it was, um, uh, I played uh, against the Billikens. Uh, they were in our league when I was at Bowling Green, so we would play Friday and Sunday and Saturday go to the Blues game, and it was like going to a game in Toronto or Montreal, right? Everybody was dressed up. That was the the style back then. That's what people did, and, and uh, it just had a real class about it. Um, and I, you know, it was a thrill to play in that building. It was it was uh, you know, a building everybody liked to play in. It was it was well lit. Uh, it was just a uh, you know for for an old I don't know circus arena. It, it was a remarkable place to play hockey. Well, you are Jordan Bennington's agent now. What have you seen from his progression over the years? We were talking about earlier that it's hard to believe that this is now his fifth full season as the Blues goaltender. What have you seen with his growth and, prog- and progression? Well, Jordan took a long time, you know, uh, to get here, right? The, the Blues had kind of moved away from him as a prospect, and uh, he played in Providence, uh, so he wasn't even eligible to play for the Blues, uh, even though they retained his rights. And um, so there was a, a lot of perseverance, a great deal of perseverance from, you know, from him uh, to, just to get to this point. And over the, the – and then he had such immediate success, I mean – uh, meteoric and and then you know he had to you know not every year is going to go like that and he's had to you know rely on that resilience and perseverance and find you know uh you know the rest of his game right i mean it was easy the first year he never lost ever so it seemed but uh, you know you go through you know you know, team goes through a rut, and you're changing your personnel, and and he's trying to find himself as a hockey player and as a goaltender. You can only do so much, you know, to motivate your team. You know, your motivation it really is you lead by performance because it's just it takes so much concentration. The margin of error is so small. So where we see Jordan now is he's he's a very mature uh, athlete in terms of his mental approach to the game. You know, he knows the boundaries or he's come to realize the boundaries of what he can do, um, you know, outside of just stopping the puck. And and that's 95 percent of any goaltenders, uh, what they're capable of doing. Um, you know, he's not a third line guy. He's not an energy guy. You, you know, you just can't bring that. You you make the right save at the right time. And that, that gives your team uh, a jump. Um, and, and and that's what he's focused on. He's, he's, I see him now playing very much for themselves, um, completely under control. And I think you're seeing Jordan play as well as he's ever played. Mike, uh, for fans that maybe don't know, uh, you represent Jordan Bennington, as we were just saying, and you are a agent. What made you go into that realm of professional sports? And once your playing career was done, all of a sudden, uh, and maybe it took a while, but you're now an agent in the, in the sports world of the National Hockey League. No, it's uh, life is funny because it uh, it was so, uh, clearly the very last thing that I had intended to do. And um, when I retired, I was very involved with the Players Association, which which was out of Toronto. I, I believed in that uh, project where they were going and and what it was ultimately going to do for the for the league and and the players. Um, and um, the idea was they would we were going to move the labor department to Detroit. That's why I went to school there. Um, that didn't happen. And I was coaching at Michigan, uh, uh, specifically with Marty Churko. And I stepped away from that because I literally had four NHL players that just called and, you know, I was not going to stay with the PA asked me to represent them. You know, we, we had free agency for the first time or unrestricted free agency. 
Um, and I thought I would do that. Yeah, I don't know. It was a staff stop gap, right? I didn't really, you know, where's the next? I'm out of law school. I'm a member of the bar. Where, where do I go now? And then a former teammate of mine, Brian Lawton, called, said, hey, we're going to start a hockey division, but uh, Octagon, which is a worldwide sports marketing company. It's a huge platform. I thought, okay, that might be pretty good for a couple of years. Um, and uh, so I started down that road, and, you know, and I'm, been the managing director now of the hockey division for uh, 15 years or so, and it's been 25 years since I've been there. So mm. I don't know how you know life. Um, I don't. I, I really can't explain it. it uh, you know, I do enjoy it. Uh, it, it. The best part of it is that your clients are all 18 to 35. So the only time I think I'm 68 is when I look in the mirror in the morning <laughs> when I shave. So, so it's, uh, they, do, they keep you young. You've got to stay current with the game. Um, and and I, I very much enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that. I, uh, you know, life changes, generations change. And, you know, we don't always agree with the younger generation, but I remember that I grew up in the 60s and I'm almost certain my parents didn't agree with what we were thinking and doing in the 60s, right? Right, no doubt. So, no. you know, so it's, been, it's, it's been great. It's, uh, uh, you know, a, a terrific company, uh, very solid, uh, represents some of the best athletes in, across the sports world and uh, events. So there's been a lot of other things that I've been uh, able to be involved with in executive committees and such. So um, it, it's been much more than just representing hockey players, but, but, uh, and we've got a great team within our hockey division, um, other agents and colleagues. So it's uh, yeah, on balance. It's been terrific. Mike, here in St. Louis, there are so many questions we could ask you, but we just don't have time. So I want to end with this. I remember walking into the arena the morning after you had been traded to Hartford and sitting there at the front desk, the woman who did everything. I mean, she was basically the receptionist that morning was Susie Matthew, who looked up and said, this one is the worst because yeah. Harry Ornest was was tearing the team apart. What's it mean for Mike Liute to be inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame on the night that Susie Matthew is going to receive that true blue award? Yeah, I think she might be the headliner uh, for tonight's uh, uh, event. Susie, um, you know, one of the first uh, female women uh, executives, if you will, in, 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 in sports. She literally did do everything. Um, you know, she was she was just really terrific. And um, what is what is standard today for, for players to have that resource? Um, um, you know, in, in terms of whatever is going on in your life or, you know, the liaison between, you know, guys in the road, obviously no cell phones, email, none of that stuff, and connecting, you know, the, the wives and, and such, and just managing all of that off ice. You know, they probably have three or four people in an organization or every organization, you know, and we had that with, with, with Susie. And, and um, most importantly, um, I, I think she felt, you know, that she was doing the right thing for her at the right time, and it was it was novel and, and important. And I think she you know, she just really loved it. I mean, she was she was as much a part of the Blues as any player. So um, you know, she would come to realize what was going on, and she had the background of seeing what it was like um, when Ralston had it under R. Hell Dean, who saved. The, I think he should be in the Hall of Fame. He Agreed. saved the franchise. Um, and I was here, but you know that that was just um, really a, 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 a terrible moment when they were talking about moving to Saskatoon. I mean, it was just that made no sense for a franchise like St. Louis. As I said, I, for me, St. Louis has always been the seventh franchise, not an original six, but they were the seventh. And um, uh, you know, so there there was that type of uh, connection, right, to the team, and they they had you know we just had such a rich. Uh, front office and Neil Francis and Dan Kelly is, I mean, Dan Kelly is one of the best announcers ever. And, you know, we had him. And so it was that community in St. Louis. And uh, Susie was certainly a huge part of that. Mike, thanks so much for the time on this day that you're going to be inducted. Looking forward to, the, to tonight. I will, I will see you over there. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on this morning. Yeah. Thank you for having me. See yeah. you there. See you, Mike. Okay, thanks. thanks.
new Blues Hall of Famer, Mike He was Leach. awesome. Yeah. He was yeah. so much fun to watch. He was, and had the coolest mask ever. Yes, Just he the, did. The white mask. That, the, the mask that people wear now, he was really the guy that brought that into into uh, play for hockey goalies. If memory serves correct, didn't Jordan Bennington, it was one of the winter classics. I think he put Louis, uh, Louis, Louis. Liute mm -hmm. on one side, mm -hmm. and he put uh, Joseph. Uh, was, it was it Cujo? Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. Was it yep. okay? Yep. Yeah. So he had Mike Liute on one side, and yeah. I said it easier that time. That's so and cool. uh, well, yeah, that was one of the questions. And I'll ask him tonight. I wonder what he thought because we used to, as fans, when he would make a save, we go Liute. <laughs> and I wonder if he thought he was being booed. <laughs> what the heck's going on here? Yeah. Uh, coming up, we're going to head down the stretch with a New Year's segment, resol New Year's resolution segment here. I'm 101 ESPN. On, uh, it's rock and roll, isn't it? Oh, is it rock and roll? Okay, here's what I got on my little... Uh -oh. Uh, oh, why did that just stick <laughs> <laughs> It is rock and roll. Next on 101 ESPN.
Can't get enough of daily fantasy? Well, thanks to our friends at Underdog Fantasy, there's a new way to play. It's called Pick'em Champions. You just pick two to five players from at least two different teams, select higher or lower on their stats, and then you're entered into your game to win. In fact, let's put together one for the NFL games this weekend. It's cold in Buffalo, so I'm going to go higher on Cook's carries of 14 and a half. Also, I'm going to go higher on five receptions in the Tampa Bay in the Lions game because Chris Godwin's been a little bit hurt. So I'm going to go higher receptions on Evans for five. Baltimore linebackers are dominant. So I'm going to go lower on Dalton Schultz's five and a half targets in that game. And then higher on the other side, Debo's going to catch a touchdown pass or maybe he's going to run one in. Either way, I'm winning because I have higher on .5 rush or receiving passes there. So that's four plays there. That means if I'm putting down five bucks, I'm winning 50 bucks just like that on Underdog Fantasy. It's super easy to play just like that, and it's even easier to get started. Just go to their easy-to-use mobile app or to underdogfantasy.com. Sign up with promo code ROCC, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. Plus, they'll give you a special pick of higher than .5 total yards to use on your first pick entry. You can add that in, make it a 5 X play now you're winning 20x your entry that's underdog fantasy promo code rocc rock to get your first deposit of ten dollars or more up to a hundred dollars doubled plus your special pick must be 18 plus and present in the state where underdog fantasy operates terms apply concern with your play call winning or gambler or visit www.ncpgambling.org Here on 101 ESPN. Uh, Brooke, Danny, Randy, and Matthew, what do you got for us? Well, we didn't talk about it too much today, so I just want to get you guys' thoughts. We did earlier in the show, talked a little bit about the NFL weekend, but I just want to give you some final thoughts here as we head into the weekend. The Saturday slate, Texans and Ravens is your first game. Packers and 49ers is your second game. Right now, the Ravens favored by 9.5, and and the 49ers also favored by 9.5. Do we see an upset on Saturday's slate? No. Mm, no. See just around the Texans? I think you see two covers. Wow. Okay, but which one, okay. if there was an upset, which one do you guys think would be more likely? CJ Shroud, uh, Lamar Jackson's 0-2 in divisional weekend. I think that he I'm has going that one too. Like two touchdowns to five interceptions that across would be those the, two games. That would be the biggest upset, Texans over Baltimore, yeah. if it happened. I, I would think Line that, of uh, nine. The ability, <laughs> number one, Aaron Jones can run. I don't think that the Texans can, with Devin Singletary and their offensive line, I don't think that they could build a running game like the Packers conceivably could against San Francisco. But then I think the other thing you have to look at uh, if you're looking at Green Bay is that they, if Jair Alexander is healthy and playing well, he can shut down a wide receiver, and that would probably be Debo. And take away one of the things that San Francisco does well. I, I would think it would be Green Bay. Really? I, I don't think it's going to happen. I, yeah. I'm more that if it, if there was one possibility, I would go with the Texans. If there's an upset, I'm going Green Bay. I don't anticipate an upset, though, this weekend. Yeah. The, the Ravens, all three of their losses, I didn't, didn't even count the last one because they didn't even play their guys against Pittsburgh. All three of their losses, they were in the lead in the final two minutes mm-hmm. against really good teams. Yes. I wonder if we're going to see, now that the season has been extended further that these teams that have just one week off come out and just never lose these games i mean one week is an eternity in a season Mm -hmm. and you can get you know all of a sudden some of the injuries heal up the bumps the bruises you can get players healthy like the tight end with baltimore so that makes a difference and from the other end of the spectrum the other team is getting exactly bumped and bruised the week before 
Other side this Sunday, slate Buccaneers at Lions, Chiefs at Bills. The Lions favored by six and a half, and the Bills, we because they're at home, are getting their three points. So it's essentially a pick 'em. I go back to when the Bucks won their final game with their season on the line, and they won nine to nothing at home. But that was Carolina. Carolina. And then last week, though, they blow out Philly. Um, I like the favorites in both these games, too. And I know I'll be wrong at something because every time you bet always the favorite, you lose. Mm -hmm. There has to be at least one that would be surprising. But I agree. I think that this is pretty clear. I don't know, though. I still think the Chiefs and Bills might be, okay, closest game this weekend. Chiefs Chiefs and Bills. Bills. Chiefs and Bills. I'm I'm scared about this one. I think it's going to be the Tampa-Detroit game. And if I'm going to pick a road team to win, it's the Bucs. The Buccaneers have the pedigree. They've they've got so many players, White and uh, Levante mm-hmm. David, and uh, obviously Godwin and uh, Evans on the on the front end uh, on on the offense. They've got so many people that have won. I could see them being a team that goes in and wins a road game. The Bucks went eight and one against the spread in road games this season. Yeah, eight and one. Good. Okay, I got to remember that for my friends. <laughs> for your, mm-hmm. for my lay friends. that over to them. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> I just I like the favorites in this weekend, although I'm hedging a little bit on Kansas City. I, I do think that Kansas City could pull off an upset. Here's my big question then. Let's just take away who wins the KC Buffalo game. I guess just go, is the winner in the 30s or 20s? How much does the weather affect that, that game? Is it about, is it the same pace we've seen of the previous Bills and Chiefs game? 35-30? Yeah. Or is it a little bit slower because of the weather? I don't think the weather's going to matter because if you watch Josh Allen play Mm -hmm. last weekend, it didn't matter with him there. So I don't know if it's going to matter this weekend, too. I'm worried about Kansas City in this game. I I wouldn't be surprised if this winds up being an 11 to 14 point win for Buffalo. I could see a blowout. Definitely a blowout. Chiefs defense, I think, makes a huge difference in this game. So I probably low scoring just maybe because of that. I have uh, totally contradicted myself on every pick that I've made. But you're good. You're clear now. Yeah. You're covered. When... Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman would wait until the playoffs to unleash Kaepernick. Yeah. And he ran for 182 one time against Green Bay in the playoffs. I kind of think that's what Brady is doing with Allen here. I wouldn't be surprised if they unleashed Josh Allen this weekend because Spag's defense is not, it's a defense that attacks scheme and they do a great job of it. But playing outside the scheme like Allen does, I man, I think he can do great things. So it'll be a fun weekend of football. And, of course, we have Blues Hockey tomorrow night here on 101 ESPN as well. And don't forget tonight we have at the MAC the Blues with their Hall of Fame induction. Is that open Mm -hmm. to the public? Uh, Tickets were available. I don't know if they still are, but you can go to stlblues.com. I think they're showing it on the Channel 4 HD channel as well live. So it'll be good. Great job today by our producer, audio video engineer, the one, the only Matthew Rocchio. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. There will also be a special TV special on the 25th. Is that on Bally or Ford, you know? Uh, I think it's on Ford. Okay, good. Brooke, did you have fun today? I did, yeah. yes. She's wearing her St. Louis Blues blue. I am. Yeah. I'm ready to go. Hashtag LGB. Uh, Danny, it was great having you in here again. Always great to see you guys, and I'll see you next week. Yep, you have a great weekend. You too. Y'all, thanks for tuning in, <laughs> texting in, and being a part of the show. Did I do it right? Y'all, yeah, that was good. <laughs> Until Monday morning at 7. Have a great weekend, St. Louis. And now for something completely different. Hey, y'all.